Welcome to Torquay, welcome to the 2023 Swallows Head and Neck Cancer Conference. Um, what I am going to do, there's a couple of things, but I don't want to steal any of Chris's thunder because for those of you that have been to these before, know what Chris is like. Uh, so first of all, these things can't happen without the help and support of the sponsors. So please, large round of applause for the sponsors for helping make this happen. Next up, this, indulge me for a moment, this is just something personal. Um, I'm very fortunate today. Maz, sorry mate. I've got somebody from my own personal MDD team here today. Maz, could you stand up for me? Come on Maz, please. If it wasn't for this man, I wouldn't be here. Thanks Maz. <laughs> now, I appreciate that this is the first time for some people. Could I ask you just to stand up for me, those that it's the first time? Just stand up for me. Wow, quite a few first timers. You're in for a treat then over the next couple of days. For those that have been, stay standing. No one said sit down, come on. For those that have been before, can I ask you to stand? Fantastic. Now what I'm going to ask you to do, because Chris is next door, he can hear you, can I please have a big round of applause for Chris and the rest of the Swallows team putting this fantastic event together. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. I knew I was going to get a standing ovation one way or another. <laughs> please just take a seat. We've got a video for you to enjoy first of all to kick things off as is tradition. So please get comfortable enjoy and just remember one thing this week well this next couple of days laughter is the best medicine thank you i expect something more interesting than that that is torquay madam no, it's not good enough <laughs> okay brilliant sam well it's good to have this chat because the first thing we need to discuss is the head and neck cancer conference we're hosting in torquay Yes, we're all looking forward to that, <laughs> but we need to be in touch with Sharon. I'll set up a get-together with everyone before the event to get into the nitty-gritty. Good idea. You know how hard Sharon works to make the conference a success. She does an amazing job. She does. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to come today and there's a lot to get through. Yes, thanks Phil, but I really think we should show our appreciation for Sharon who does such a tremendous job organising everything against the odds every year. Cheers Sharon. Thank you. Cheers. I'd just like to say... Thanks to Hida for organising this. We're really looking forward to the conference this year. I'd just like to say... This is all very exciting, isn't it, Fahida? It is so exciting. Now, the first thing on the agenda is the conference intro. <coughs> I'd just like to say... Thanks, Fahida. Yes, the intro is very important. But I'd just like to add, in my role as president, I think there should be a degree of dignity on this occasion, rather than just making a fool of myself. <coughs> I'd just like to say... Shut, Shut up, up Chris. Chris! My God, you're ugly, aren't you? <laughs> What ideas do we have for the intro? Well, there is one outstanding theme which I think would work very well. OK, great. Sounds promising. Have you spoken to Sharon about it? Not entirely. I thought I might share it with Chris first. Who? Chris, Sharon's husband. Oh, yeah, him. <laughs> yes, I've sent him a special package. It's a conference manual. I think it would be perfect for him and make him feel a bit more involved. OK, moving on. The first item is the intro. Fahida? OK, uh, Peter. Chris. Yes, Chris. We sent you a package marked conference manual. Did you remember to bring it along? Mm. Get a clean one. It's clean now. <laughs> oh, it's dirty now. You can open it now, Chris. We think you'll find it useful. Well, 
Manuel done. Is it Manuel? Yes, Manuel. Manuel? The one thing Torquay is famous for is faulty towers. Is this a piece of your brain? <laughs> Brilliant. So Chris is going to be playing Manuel. <laughs> I think he was born to play Manuel. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, be a poppet. Go out and change into your outfit. There's a good chat. Brilliant. Everyone knows Faulty Towers. And Chris would make the perfect Manuel. He'd be a natural. Manuel, let me explain. Ah! <laughs> what about his script? From what I've heard, he's not very keen at learning his lines. Don't worry, I've thought of that too. Perfect, Manuel. You look great. Here's a script we made just for you. A script? Chris doesn't do learning lines. <clears throat> Can I just say something? Not to worry. This will be the perfect role for Chris. Have a look. See what you think. So all of his dialogue is Ken? Okay. Nah, I'm sure he'll have more to say knowing him, but it's Manuel's favourite line. Even Chris couldn't get that wrong. So, what do you think, Chris? Q. So what's happening after that? Well, hopefully we'll have a bit of time to rehearse the conference opening. Now we have Manuel as our star. Let's hope he can handle a bit of Spanish. Spanish? <laughs> He's from Barcelona. <laughs> Okay, Peter. Chris. Yes, Chris. Sorry, so, applause, applause, applause. You walk to the podium, everyone is delighted to see you, you wait till they have finished applauding, then you say... Hola, senoras y alamanes. Mi nombre, el Manuel. I'm sorry, I thought there was something wrong with you. Blimey, this isn't gonna work. Que? Que? What did he say? Aquí estamos, en la hermosa Turquía. Soy de Barcelona. Y bienvenidos a la Conferencia Internacional de Cabezas y Galas. That doesn't sound right. You always say. What? Okay. I learn, I learned it from my book. Can you try it again? Okay. In English? Ah, see. Sí. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Barcelona. Torquay. Right, that's enough. We need someone to play Basil. <laughs> I thought we were doing it with just Manuel. Well, it's a good job I'm here then, isn't it? Because I took the trouble to organise a costume for Basil. And what's more, I got it in Philip's size. Oh, blimey. Manuel thinking on his feet. Who knew? OK. OK. So where is Philip? He's getting changed into the costume I organised. Basil, come on out. Your audience is waiting. <laughs> oh, what? What's that supposed to be? I don't know, but this tail chafes a bit. Chris, what exactly did you order? It's the star of Faulty Towers. It's Basil. That's not Basil Faulty. That's Basil Brush, you numpty. Okay. Chris, this Sharon, this Sharon's hand, this slap on head. I know nothing. I know nothing. <laughs> Please try to understand before one of us dies. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Basil Faulty. Welcome to Torquay. And welcome to the International Head and Neck Cancer Conference 2023. I do hope you enjoyed that little faulty tower skit. However, as I own the copyright, you will all be hearing from my lawyers very soon. Now, would you please welcome to the stage two people who definitely do need an introduction. The CEO of Swallows, Chris Curtis, and President of the Conference, Philip Rees. Oh. 
Well, what do we think? <laughs> Famous actor down here. What do, I, what do you think? Got a job? Wonderful. Wonderful. There you go. That's enough. So, over to you, Mr. President, or Basil, or... Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming here. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure how long I'm going to carry this off because I can't see where I am or breathe, but um, it's fantastic that uh, so many people have come here. So many people have come here. Yeah, I'll take it off from you, Basil. Oh. <laughs> that was interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming here. Thank Chris, thank you so much for inviting me to be the president of the conference. And uh, we're so looking forward to the next couple of days of, of essentially what Chris has organized, an amazing variety of, of speakers. Um, I've just been so impressed just looking through the list. And I'm, as a head and neck surgeon, incredibly interested for everyone, for everything that we're going to see and hear. Fab. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm sorry about Basel 40 and me trying to take off Manuel, but I think I've done not too bad, I don't think. I think Basel was fantastic. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was wondering last night that uh, we all went out for a meal last night. There was no alcohol past anyone's lips after 1 a.m. this morning, but... Um, but I was wondering, this guy was on call and he suddenly got rushed away before his suite. And I wondered if he was doing an operation at the hospital, whether he has his mask on. That would have been phenomenal if he had it done, because that would have been great. But, you know, you've got a, you've got a guy here at the top of his profession, and then he wears a Basel 40. That needs a round of applause. Um, it just shows that all our nurses and doctors and consultants are human beings. May not look at it sometimes, but they are all human beings. These two ladies, I think, deserve a round of applause. Um, was, it, was it too embarrassing? All right. She, they didn't see it until just now. We don't let them see it. What about the guy behind doing the weights? Was he acceptable? That's the new boyfriend, by the way. Um, there's a new boyfriend on Fahida's radar. Nobody in the world has seen him yet. So John had an interview with him, and that's why she, he was behind her. So now I understand why she doesn't put him out in the public. So, um, but yeah, fantastic. So we're going to get moving on a little bit. Um, I'm going to just announce two things. You've got a mobile phone app. Please go on that and register it and, and go on there. There's also the conference community forum. If you register on there then there'll be lots of messages throughout the two days. Go on there and interact and talk to each other. That'd be fantastic. Thank you to all our sponsors. Without our sponsors, and there's a lot of them here, there's some that didn't book on because they were too late. Unfortunately, we only have so many tables. But without those, this doesn't happen. So please, at lunch times and at breaks, make the effort and go and see them and talk to them. And then they don't ask for a refund. No, just make sure you go and see them because they do put a lot of money in this to make it happen. The charity could not afford to put it on without sponsors. Um, and, you know, we appreciate those sponsors fantastically. So please, please, please make sure you go and speak to them. Um, so um, there are headline sponsors. I've got a screen here, which is Thor, Rockshaw, which is medical cannabis. Unfortunately, they were going to come, but the police stopped them on the M5. Um, <laughs> They had a load of samples in the back of their van and for some reason the police now have got all those samples and they're not coming here. Um, and we've obviously got Merck um, is one of our headline sponsors. And then we've got lots of other sponsors as well. So thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to go to the next slide now, I think. The Swallows Head and Neck Cancer Support Group is a truly global charity with connections on every continent. Dedicated to patients and caregivers, this once humble charity was born out of necessity. Back in 2011, Chris Curtis was a successful marketing executive with a wide circle of friends and an appetite for life. After finding a lump on his neck, in May that year, Chris went to see a specialist. He was told he had cancer. 
On hearing this devastating news, Chris's life went into a downward spiral of confusion, despair and depression. His wife Sharon was the one left to pick up the pieces, becoming his carer, his therapist and the family breadwinner, running the home, bringing up the children, and holding down a full-time job. She managed his peg feeding, along with arranging all his radiotherapy appointments. He stopped communicating, stopped seeing his friends, and he lost 12 stone in weight. After visiting a local meeting group, Chris was disillusioned, so he decided to apply his own skills and energy and create something more about support and awareness. The Swallows is now one of the fastest growing charities in the UK and in 2017 was given the Queen's Award for Voluntary Work. This was presented to Chris and Sharon at Buckingham Palace. The Swallows was set up to allow patients and caregivers access to support and help right at the point they need it. There are monthly meetings around the UK and internationally for both patients and caregivers. They offer an opportunity to chat to people in similar circumstances and often feature guest speakers. They also look at available medication for improving quality of life. The Swallows offers a 24-7 helpline for patients and caregivers by calling 07504 725 059. It isn't a call center, it's a live conversation with dedicated, caring people offering practical or emotional support. The Swallows also provide support boxes containing market-leading medical products to send out to patients. In many cases, patients can contact the Swallows Direct to request their own box, which will help with everything from dry mouth, mucositis, or other oral health issues. Face-to-face -face meetings are also available to both patients and caregivers. Amazing! If it's felt that someone needs additional and immediate support, the Swallows team will travel to anywhere in the UK to make that contact, in person. The Swallows have also raised tens of thousands of pounds for hospitals to buy vital equipment, such as robotics for head and neck cancer surgery, or an early detection scanner. On a personal level, they also work with individuals, offering grants of up to £250 for clothes, microwaves, fridges, TVs, or anything a patient or caregiver may need to improve their situation during treatment. And don't forget, the annual International Head and Neck Cancer Conference. Each year, hundreds of patients and caregivers gather to see guest speakers, discuss key topics and innovations in treatment. The Swallows are a leading UK charity with the Royal Seal of Approval. It's a truly global operation with connections on every continent. Giving patients and caregivers support and help right at the point they need it. The Swallows, Head and Neck Cancer Support Charity. So that's just, um, <coughs> I get very emotional. <coughs> that's just a little bit, obviously, about the Swallows. Um, started because of my journey, as you saw there. Um, and yeah, I'm very proud of the Swallows for what we've done. And now I can't do it without all the support that I get from patients, caregivers, and people around the world. Um, we now are literally a, a charity that goes right around the world supporting patients. Our 24-7 number, it's Sharon that answers that call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. My wife, Sharon, doesn't matter what time that call rings, she takes the call. If it's a carer, she talks to them. And if it's a patient, it gets handed over to me. Um, the other night before we came here at quarter to 12, we, in the evening, we were on a call to a patient that had just been told that morning that they've got, they got cancer. They were on, on their own at home. And I spent an hour with them until about quarter to one, one o'clock in the morning, and hopefully set her off a little bit happier than what she was when she rang us. So yeah, we, it is a true 24-7 number, and it's available to anyone to call. It's not an answer phone service. It is literally someone ringing. So please, please make sure that word goes out. It's important. Our support boxes, we do anywhere up to 100 of those a week. And again, me and Sharon pack them, post them, and send them off. So please make sure patients, you health professionals, get one of those boxes because it certainly helps. And again, we can't do those boxes without our sponsors 
giving products away free of charge to put in those boxes. So please, that's it. Um, last year I got told off for not telling people about the swallows. So this year I'm not going to say sorry for taking up time now to tell you about the swallows because I think it's important that you guys understand what we do. So please, please, you know, make sure that the swallows is recommended globally around the world. Um, there's two hospitals in Saudi Arabia where we look after patients. Um, America, Australia, New Zealand, 120 hospitals across Spain that we look after. So please, make sure that, you know, we get that word out there. And we've got a guest here today from America. We've got a lady from Canada. We've got people from all around the world, even at this conference today, that's travelled miles and miles. Um, it took me six hours to get from Blackpool. And I think, Ed, you almost done it from California, not Co where? Colorado, quicker than I could get from Blackpool. <laughs> so it just shows you what, you know, what our motorways are like. But thank you very much that you, know, you guys are here. I hope you really do enjoy the two days. Please, lots of questions when the speakers give you the opportunity to speak. I'm going to ask the two ladies if they want to leave the stage. Big round of applause for our two wonderful nurses. <clears throat> the Delegate e-book, because we're now looking after the world um, and trying to cut back on printing, even though we printed all those, but that's another story. Um, these were cheaper than the book. That's, that's another story. But the Delegate e-book, if you find this on your table, on your chair, and you go to the back page, if you scan the little QR code, you'll get the Delegate e-book. So please make sure you read that. There's some great articles in there and some great information in there. So please download the Delegate e-book. We also have pins in the room. Normally we have people making sure we get money off you. Last year we'd done this and everyone says they don't carry cash with them anymore. And yeah, I don't carry cash around with me. No excuse this year, because if you scan that QR code, you can use your phone and pay. So please make sure you take a pin, wear it with pride, but just scan it. And we ask for a minimum donation of two pound. If you can do that, that's fantastic. If you've got cash, put it in the box. We don't, we don't refuse cash. Sharon will always take cash. She's great at cash in Marks and Spencers. No, sorry, that's another thing. But please, no excuses. You've got a QR code. So, and there's QR codes in here as well. But take the pin and wear it with pride. Um, I'm going to hand you now to you to introduce our next speakers. Good morning. Um, well, it should be a short and sweet introduction, really. Uh, we've got Professor Ali Karam and... Uh, uh, Dr. Paul Hankinson, who are pathologists from uh, Sheffield uh, Hallamshire, Hos Hallamshire Hospital, is it? Yeah. Uh, that'll do, it's probably changed to some extent. So th these guys will give the latest update on head and neck cancer pathology and what it means and, and how important it is to us. You want to take a seat there, Phil, and ask the guy to leave the stage? <clears throat> so, my name's Paul, and I'm a registrar in oral and maxillofacial pathology at the University of Sheffield and Sheffield Teaching Hospitals. Uh, thanks for inviting me, Chris, to talk um, to you guys. I've been asked to explain what a pathologist is, because lots of people don't know, and why they're actually with you from the first steps of your journey. So, this presentation's more aimed at patients, so could you just put your hand up if you're a patient, just indicate how many we've got. Excellent. So this is more aimed at you guys than the clinicians in the audience. And um, I will warn you, I've got a couple of photographs of some specimens from patients. So if any of you are a bit squeamish, be ready to turn away if you need to. Okay, I'll try and warn you as they, as they come along. So these are the questions that I'm going to try and answer. What is a pathologist? Um, what do they do for you? What do they do for head and neck cancer patients? And what can you do for your pathologist as well? So for that first question, and um, probably lots of you recognize this, clinicians and patients. This is our pathway, our sort of cancer journey, at least from the hospital's perspective. I understand there's a lot more outside that as well for patients. So most people with a head and neck cancer, they'll see their, their GP or their dentist with a concern. 
the GPR dentist will then refer them on to a hospital to see a specialist, such as an ENT surgeon or an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. Um, and after that, most patients, they have a biopsy to confirm a diagnosis of cancer. So I've just highlighted that. That's the first step that a pathologist is involved. So before you've even been given your diagnosis of cancer by your surgeon, by your clinician, a pathologist is involved in that process, in that journey. A pathologist is present at every multidisciplinary team meeting that will be um, sort of had to discuss patients and their care. They're present at the point of surgery. They examine the specimen, the cancer that's been removed from patients to give extra information to clinicians, to surgeons. And they're present throughout the follow-up process as well. Um, ideally to the, the sort of ultimate outcome of, of discharge and survivorship. So that explains where we are in the journey. So we're right at the beginning, even before a diagnosis has been given, looking at the biopsy, and we're present right the way through towards the end. So most people, when they think of a pathologist, they think of the medical examiner, they think of the crime scene investigators, they think of forensic pathologists. And that's the TV sort of view of what a pathologist is. It's the person who, who looks at the poor victim, determines the cause of death, and helps the police catch the bad guys. Some pathologists do that, but only very few in reality. The majority of pathologists, what they actually do is they look at tissue from living patients to provide a diagnosis and make sure they get the most appropriate treatment. Another thing that some people think a pathologist might be, a lot of people think a pathologist is a machine. So you put, you put the biopsy somewhere in that little black box and the computer shoots out an answer, is it cancer or not? And even some of our clinical colleagues are guilty of thinking that as well. But actually there's a person behind the biopsy specimen, there's a person that has to look at it and give that diagnosis. So what actually is a pathologist? Um, the definition is it's someone who studies disease, but more specifically and more relevant to patients with cancer. It's a medical or dental specialist who's done extra training to diagnose diseases, predominantly using a microscope. In the UK, there's actually fewer than 40 of those forensic TV, TV pathologists, so there's very few of them, but there are, there are about 1,000 histopathologists, which is the most common type of pathologist. And those are the people, like myself, like Professor Karam, we look at um, tissue from patients to give a diagnosis and make sure they're getting the right treatment. And um, sort of, I suppose, important for patients with head and neck cancer, in the UK there's about 40 pathologists who are actually from a dental background and they specialise entirely in, in head and neck cancers. So our day-to-day -day work, rather than it looking, being looking at bodies, which is the sort of TV perception of what it is, what we actually do is a combination of specimen dissection and reporting. So the specimen dissection, um, we're given an organ or part of an organ by our surgeons who've removed it for treatment of a patient. We have to look through that tissue because we can't look at all of it with a microscope. There's far too much to look at. We have to be quite selective and just pick the bits that we think are most relevant to examine. We then look at it down a microscope and that's the process of reporting. So everything that we've taken that we think is relevant, we look at with a microscope, and once we've looked at it all, we come up with a diagnosis and other important information, which we write in a written report, which is why we call that process reporting. So that's the majority of our day. <coughs> Lots of pathologists are involved in teaching as well. We teach students, we teach qualified healthcare professionals as well about disease, and lots of us do research as well. So Part of my job is research, part of Professor Karam's job is research as well, for us particularly cancer research, head and neck cancer research. So that's kind of introduced what a pathologist is. It's not the TV perception of uh, the guy who helps the police catch the bad guy. The majority of pathologists in the world look at tissue from living patients to give that diagnosis uh, and ultimately help make sure that they get the most appropriate treatment. So. That's what a pathologist is. What do they do for you? What do they do for head and neck cancer patients? So if we go back to that journey, that pathway, the sort of hospital part of the cancer journey, and I mentioned that biopsy is where we start. So we've got the first image coming up. So I'll explain what a biopsy is. A biopsy is a piece of tissue from a patient that's used for a diagnosis. And most often that diagnosis is made by a pathologist. So in this example, we've got a patient and we can see the right side of their tongue. They've got an ulcer there. This patient's oral and maxillofacial surgeon is concerned that this might be cancer, so they've done a biopsy. And that red ellipse is about the size and shape of a biopsy that would be done for this patient, for this specimen. So they've done that and they've sent it off to the lab. 
And this is how we receive it here. This is what it looks like to us. It's not really much. It's less than half an inch long. There's not really much to go on, but we work with what we get. So the most uh, common thing that we do with it is we actually cut that tissue in half so we can look at it a bit better in more detail, see more of it. And it goes into one of these yellow plastic things called a cassette, it's a piece of plastic that it needs to go in for processing. The blue bit is a sponge that it's sat on just to help keep it in position inside that cassette. It goes off to our lab technicians who cut really, really thin slices of it and put it on glass slides like this. It's stained with a red dye and a blue dye and that color together sort of combined gives that pinky purple look to the, uh, to the tissue on the slide. And then we put it on a microscope and we can look at it down that microscope. So this is to sort of help visualize better exactly what's happening. So if you imagine that piece of tissue that we had at the beginning that we cut in half, once it's on the microscope, we magnify it. This is about times 20 magnification, but obviously it's on a big screen. I've enlarged it for the presentation so it's even bigger. And that's what we see as a pathologist looking down the microscope. And where all those clumps of red are in those pinky areas, that's where the cancer is invading into that tongue. So there's lots of things that we look at as pathologists to diagnose something as cancer or not, a huge number of things, um, and I'll just try and explain one of them. So the picture on the left is a really close-up view of cancer, whereas the picture on the right is normal, healthy tissue. Um, and the thing that I want to explain is just the size of those cells. So not everyone necessarily knows what a cell is, but if you look at what those sort of purpley black circles are on the left side, think about the size of those, and then if you look at the picture on the right side, those purple blue dots, that's exactly the same magnification. So the cancer cells on that left side are much, much bigger, or sorry, yeah, it's your left on the left side are much, much bigger than on the right side. And there's dozens of other things that we look at as well. But I thought I'd explain at least one of those things to you so you can get an idea. So when we get a biopsy, we've got a few questions. The first, is it cancer or is it something else that's causing this problem, like an infection or any other diseases that can occur? If it is cancer, what type of cancer it is, because there's lots of different types of cancer, and also how aggressive is that cancer? And Professor Karam will go into a bit more detail about what things we use to determine how aggressive a cancer is shortly. So that's the biopsy step. Once we've written up that report, we come to the multidisciplinary team meeting, and um, some of you may be aware of, of who attends that already, but there's lots of different clinicians. There's oncologists, there's radiologists, there's surgeons, there's dietitians, there's specialist nurses. Lots of people attend that and discuss each patient case by case. And the pathologist will come and discuss their findings, tell everyone their findings. They're involved in discussions about prognosis, about how likely patients are to survive and survive their cancer, and also get ideas about what sort of management is best for that patient. For some of the less common cancers, for some of the rarer cancers, we might then have to recommend extra special tests. It might have to go to other labs for more detailed testing, but that doesn't happen too often, and that's part of it as well. So after MDT, not every head and neck cancer patient has surgery first, but many do. Um, we're involved in that point as well. As well as looking at the biopsy, when a cancer is removed, we look at the specimen as well to give more details to the surgeons. So I'm just going to warn you that the next image is a specimen, so if you're squeamish, maybe look away. So this is an example of a neck dissection specimen. Um, and that sort of elliptical shape that looks a bit like skin, that is skin. And the rest of the tissue underneath is the tissues that sit underneath the uh, neck. So this has been removed because this patient had a metastasis to their neck and as a pathologist we need to find where the tumour is, get an idea about the important features of that disease so that we can share it with the clinical team. Often the easiest way to do that is to slice the tissue through like a loaf of bread and then we lay it out flat so we can see things better. So um, those orange and green bits, you might be wondering what that is. That's actually paint that the pathologist has put on the outside of that specimen. So we often put paint on the outside of a specimen before we slice it, because then we know where a surgeon's cut and where we've cut. Because one of the key things that we need to do is work out um, how close that tumour is to the margins. You, you might have heard that before about clear margins or, or involved margins. So we measure that by measuring the distance between the ink and where the tumour is down the microscope. So that's what the ink's for. Um, where the hole is in the middle two bits, that's where the cancer is. So that's where it started to de 
degrade. It started to break down, and that's why there's the hole in the middle. And all that whitish area around that hole is where the tumor is. I've got a picture of that cassette again on there. That's about the amount of tissue we can look at under a microscope in one go. Any more than that, and it might not fit onto the glass slides for us to look at. So we have to be quite selective with what we look at with a microscope. And those red boxes are just some examples of what bits we might want to look at in more detail. So we don't just look at everything with our microscope. Um, a lot of what we do is actually looking through the tissue with our naked eye to assess what's important to look at and what's less important to look at. Okay, so once we've done that, we've got lots of questions to an answer, but the main things are, how big is the cancer? How aggressive is it? Has it spread? So if it started on the tongue, has it spread to the neck? And is it all out? Has it all been removed? So often in Sheffield, at our multidisciplinary team meetings um, for complex specimens, we provide a summary similar to this. So we'll give them a photograph of the specimen, and highlighted here on red is where we're concerned that that tumour has been cut through by the surgeon, and that unfortunately there's some still left behind in the patient. The orange areas are where there's tumour close to those measured margins, but not necessarily involved. So there's a risk that the patient might get recurrence. Obviously, this, this, in this example, it's all, it's all made up. It not, ne not necessarily was the case for this patient. We have lots of other information um, as well about what specific type of cancer it is, how big it is, and um, features about the aggressiveness. And right at the bottom, you might see the bit that says final pathological staging. So you may have been told the stage of your cancer by your surgeons. Um, and that code is the sort of code that we use to communicate with each other about how extensive a cancer is, how far it's spread, and what the likely prognosis is as well. Uh, it's sort of a, a way of us easily summarizing to each other what, what's going on exactly, because every, everyone's cancer is slightly different. So that's surgery, and through the follow-up process, obviously follow-up's really important for lots of things, for managing, um, making sure all the wounds have healed after surgery, for making sure your symptoms are under control, to making sure you're getting the support that you need. But one of the things that's really important is monitoring for recurrence, because every time a patient has a cancer, there's a risk that it can come back. So one of the things that surgeons do at those follow-up appointments is check to see if the cancer's come back. And we're involved in that process as well. For us to be able to confirm if a cancer's come back, it needs a biopsy. In exactly the same way that I explained at the beginning, um, we look at that biopsy specimen to be able to give that diagnosis or hopefully reassurance that actually it's not cancer, it's maybe a bit of scarring, it's a bit of infection after surgery. So we're involved at that end as well. So hopefully we've, we've answered those two questions then. What is a pathologist? What do they do for head and neck cancer patients? And then the last bit, what can you do for pathologists? I don't think we're really asking for that much. Um, just remember that we exist. Keep us in mind that not all pathologists are like on TV. They're not crime fighters. Actually, what they do is they, they help living patients get a diagnosis and make sure they get the most appropriate treatment. So that, that's all I've got to say for now. I'm very happy to answer any questions at the end of the session. But Professor Karam's going to do a bit of talking about some other topics in pathology as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, it's scary when your trainees are better than you, so. Um, thanks, Chris, Sharon, uh, for inviting us, um, and for all of you for attending. As you can see, I'm a professor and a consultant pathologist in Sheffield, and I wear many hats nationally and internationally, but the one that I wear most proudly uh, is the patron uh, of uh, the Solos Head and Neck Cancer Charity, so that's a very, very rewarding experience. So today I'll just be elaborating a little bit more uh, on things that Paul has already mentioned, but also sharing some uh, more information about some new and digital technologies that can potentially um, help pathologists. If it moves, that is. There we go. So I don't think I need to tell this audience about the importance of head and neck cancer, but the biggest issue we have is that the numbers are continually increasing. Although the surgical approaches and treatments and, and the oncology treatments like chemotherapy and radiotherapy have improved, the numbers are still increasing. Uh, the survival of the patients is not improving. And the patients got a lot of uh, side effects afterwards in the sense of not just uh, the physical disability, but also uh, quality of life uh, being significantly affected. 
a lot of these cancers are preventable. So is there something we can do actually to identify these early or try and find patterns within the tissues which can actually help the surgeons, but also you in terms of how this cancer might behave. And oral or head and neck cancers are one of the very few cancers which are projected to continue increasing uh, in terms of numbers. And now we're seeing a younger demographic, patients who don't smoke and don't drink, who are also getting head and neck cancer. So as Paul mentioned, most of the job involves looking down the microscope, looking at pink and purple dots. And this is from when uh, Chris and uh, Sharon were visiting um, Sheffield, and we were just showing them some examples of how cancer looks down the microscope. And um, as you heard, we've got a key role in diagnosis, which will start you off on your treatment journey. And then we can also try and give an idea of how cancer might behave uh, based on a subjective or manual analysis, if you like, and how you might respond to treatment. So the first thing we assess is the grade of the cancer. So the two things that you may have heard is, of course, the stage, which is the size and extent of the cancer. And there's also a grade of cancer, which is more based on pathology. And that actually just helps us identify how we think a cancer might behave in the future. It's done by a pathologist looking down the microscope. So a cancer can be well differentiated. So in this one, you can see uh, all the pink tissue that you're seeing is cancer. But centrally within that, you can see little like circles or worlds or very bright pink material. That's a protein called keratin, which is found by the lining of your, your mouth or head and neck. And the well-differentiated cancers form a lot of it. So that tells us that this cancer is actually much closer to the tissue it's arising from. So uh, I think of it as, uh, as a well-behaved cancer. So this is a cancer that we feel like is not going to be as aggressive and might be more amenable to treatment. Then we have an intermediate grade, which is mortally differentiated, that has some features of the previous category I showed you, but it's beginning to lose some of the features as well. So it's not as, or it's not looking as well-behaved is still forming that pink protein, keratin, but not as much of it. And on the other spectrum, you've got poorly differentiated cancers. So these are not forming any of that protein. They start to look very different to the cells or tissues they originated from, and they also start to show things like this tissue death or necrosis. And you can think of them as like asbos of the cancer world. So yeah, they are going to be difficult to treat, they're going to be aggressive, likely to spread as well. So the stage is, of course, clinical, but there's also the pathological features that can feed into the stage as well. Uh, Paul has already mentioned the tumor size, uh, and uh, I'll just talk about some of the other things in terms of how advanced the disease is locally. So we look at how deep the cancer is, so measure it from the surface, and all of that is done manually. And for some of the cancer specimens resections, we might have hundreds of slides. So a resection, on average, will probably take at least six to seven hours of a pathologist's time start to finish. So here there's a depth of invasion showing you is 3.5 millimeter. The evidence we have right now, there's more than four or five millimeter is much more likely to spread to other parts of the body. And then we also look at how it's um, extending or invading into the underlying tissue. So the top layer is the one we are interested in. Okay, the top bright pink layer, that's your lining of the mouth that you can see. And that's the one that's become cancerous and starts going inside. Okay. So we don't want it going too much inside, and if it is going inside, we want it all to go together as a cohesive unit rather than all over the place, because that again is a bad sign. Then we look at whether the cancer has gone into nerves. So we've got nerves and blood vessels, uh, which actually supply nutrients and sensations to all parts of a body, and the head and neck is no different. Okay? So the little round structures that you're seeing in the middle of all of these pictures are nerves. And surrounding these are slightly darker cells, which are the cancer cells. And what cancer cells do is they try to find the path of least resistance. So they wrap themselves around these nerves, which means that they can travel to other parts of the body. So it is quite important for us to identify this, because this is one of the features that is going to tell us whether the patient needs more aggressive treatment or how likely the cancer is to come back. But similarly, the cancer cells can uh, get into vessels as well. So your blood vessels or lymphatic vessels they don't only supply nutrients to keep the tissue alive, but they can also take the material or excess fluid from your tissue uh, to lymph nodes at the parts of the body and also help you fight infections as well. And the little sort of circular things that you're seeing in the tissue um, with the gaps are your blood vessels. And within that, you can see these darker islands uh, sitting, which are tumor cells. So once they get access to a vessel, that means that it's basically like the body's plumbing. 
And once the cancer gets into that plumbing, then it can actually go anywhere along the route of that plumbing. We look at whether the cancer has gone into bone. That's quite an important feature because that usually tells us it's quite aggressive. So patients who don't have any teeth, the cancer can just spread straight into bone from top to bottom. But patients who do have teeth, it can come from the side, from your gums, and then uh, get into bone that way. And again, there's evidence to suggest that once you get tumor or cancer in the bone, then it makes it easier for it to spread to other parts of the body. And then of course, we look at whether it's spread uh, in the neck. So all the green dots that you're seeing on the screen are the different types or um, groups of lymph nodes that you get and might be uh, removed as part of the surgery. And it's our job to actually assess every bit of tissue that's provided to identify those nodes, but also then examine them each under the microscope to see whether there's any cancer in the node. Okay? So here's an example of what a lymph node looks like under the microscope. They look like little balls. They look quite blue, most of them, particularly the bottom two. And they're all full of uh, immune cells or lymphocytes, and that's why I call lymph nodes. The lymphocytes are your um, white blood cells. But the top two nodes look slightly pink as well. And in these areas which I've highlighted, you can see that there is a bit of cancer hiding uh, in the lymph node. So that tells us that this cancer is actually already spread to a lymph node in the neck. This is a much more obvious example. But there can be other examples where it's not as obvious. So this is quite a large lymph node. And on first glance, you can't see anything obvious in there. But there's a very tiny little area of suspicion. And when you zoom in, then you can identify there's a tiny little cancer deposit sitting in the lymph node. So we actually have to go through 60, 70, 80 lymph nodes of each patient at a very high magnification manually uh, to make sure that we do not miss anything. And then sometimes these cancers can actually start to spread out of the lymph nodes. So they grow and grow and grow, and then they start to destroy the capsule or the lining of this lymph node and then burst out into your neck, uh, which means that they can get access to fat and muscle, and that makes it very difficult to treat. So <clears throat> there's quite a few different things that I mentioned to you. In addition to that, HPV status is also another thing that's quite important. All of these can help and give us some indication of how cancer might behave. But all of these are quite subjective because they are being manually assessed. How I might assess them or measure them might be slightly different to how Paul or another pathologist is doing it. And it takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort. And there's also a possibility to miss things or overcall things sometimes. And this is where some of our research sort of focuses on, are there any new technologies that can potentially help with this? <clears throat> so if you look at this, uh, figure, uh, pathologists are very good at identifying differences between normal and diseased and uh, different types of diseases. So if you were to actually differentiate between the box on the left side of the screen and the right side of the screen, uh, you can appreciate that there's a slight difference, a subtle difference. But with the naked eye, just any two boxes that are adjacent to each other are very difficult to differentiate. They look very similar. We can't put a number on it. So this is where hopefully things like uh, computers and AI can potentially help. And one big change in pathology over the last few years has been the introduction of digital pathology, which means that the glass slides that Paul was showing you after all the process now can be scanned at a very high magnification to a very good resolution, which means we do not need to always use a microscope. We can actually use a computer to not only look at them, but also look and um, identify or apply some sort of computer techniques to uh, find things and patterns, but also measure things digitally as well. And it became particularly popular during uh, COVID because pathologists or people weren't allowed in the hospitals and the uh, um, possibility of being uh, able to re uh, report these cases remotely, uh, just sitting uh, at home using a screen uh, became very appealing and it's become more and more common. <clears throat> And all those measurements that I was talking about that are quite manual and tedious and subjective become much more objective because using a ruler on a software is going to be much more consistent uh, between people. But the best thing about these is that it is, gives us another image. Basically, pathology becomes a digital image like any other image, which means we can apply things like AI, artificial intelligence to it. And all of us are using AI in our daily lives whether we know it or not, if you're using Uber or Google Maps or Spotify or Netflix, all of these things have got AI working in the background. The recommendations it gives you as well is based on what you previously have watched and it's trying to identify what you may or may not like. 
So there's no reason that the same techniques can't be applied to pathology as well. So I won't go into too much detail, but basically it uses uh, techniques called machine learning and deep learning. And the whole process is, or idea is, that you train the computers using human knowledge, and you try and minimize the human input. So you train or teach them as much based on the experience you have, and then they learn and identify those patterns themselves, which takes away some of the human element. It makes the process faster, it makes the process much more objective and efficient as well. And also it will analyze every single bit of tissue on a slide. So as Paul said, as a, as a human pathologist, no one can identify or analyze every single cell on a slide, but an AI model can. However, it's not really been explored in head and neck cancer much. So this is some of the work we've been doing for the last few years. Um, Hania is one of the uh, doctor fellows who's working with me right now. She did some background work in terms of identifying what's the quality of evidence of use of AI in head and neck cancer. And we found that it's quite poor. Very few studies have done it. And the ones that have done it, uh, the techniques and uh, the quality is not great. So I started working with the, this uh, group in uh, Warwick, uh, Professor Rajput's group, his Tissue uh, Image Analytics Center. And um, on the top, you'll see these uh, pink images, pink and uh, blue images like the ones Paul showed you. They are the standard pathology images. And in the bottom row, you're seeing different colors. And this is an AI uh, algorithm automatically identifying where the cancer is and where your immune cells are, so where the lymphocytes are as well. So without having to actually look at it, you're feeding the image in and it's giving you an output of where the cancer is, where the different types of cells are. And using this, we could actually um, predict how patients may or may not behave. So if you look at the bottom right, the two curves, um, the patients who actually had more of the immune cells using this digital method uh, showed much significant or better survival compared to those who had less uh, of these cells. And part of that process was actually just uh, automating the analysis. So on the left-hand side, you see the conventional glass slide, and then you can see the AI model coming in. So the cancer is now lit up in orange, and the rest of the tissue is lit up in blue. You can separate the orange bit from the blue tissue. You can draw the lines around it. You can automatically get a, a size and depth and measurements of it as well. And as uh, I mentioned, one of the main issues uh, that we have is that head and neck cancer spreads to lymph nodes in the neck. And it can be quite difficult and challenging assessing all of those nodes. And sometimes you can miss them if they're very small cancers. So it made us think, is there a possibility that you can use AI to actually identify these tumors in the neck uh, without a pathologist having to look at them. And again, this was in collaboration with the, with the group in Singapore and, uh, and, and the group in Warwick, where we actually used the slides, digitized them from the lymph nodes, and applied AI models. And basically what we found was that our AI models could identify all of the tumors in the lymph nodes. Okay? There were no false positives, there were no false negatives. It could do it in eight to 10 seconds, where a pathologist will probably need to spend at least one to two minutes on a node. And it could also automatically measure how big the deposit was in the lymph node as well. Then I also mentioned how the cancer can get into nerves and blood vessels, and it can be very difficult and challenging to assess that sometimes uh, because there's so many different slides and sometimes can be very subtle. Uh, so this work actually uh, looked at whether we can automatically identify where the nerves and the blood vessels are within the tissue. Uh, and we got up to 97% accuracy. So if you have a look on the top right images, the, the bits in green are the nerves and the red bits are the blood vessels. So using the AI model, you can automatically identify and highlight where the nerves and the vessels are, which means you can straight away see how close the cancer is to them, which makes it much easier to assess and predict whether this is an aggressive cancer that's invaded those structures. But one key area I spoke about is prevention, okay? So a lot of these head and neck cancers can actually be prevented. Is there something we can do actually even before it becomes cancerous? Uh, and one of my main areas of interest is looking at oral dysplasia, uh, which is a uh, pre-cancer state of the mouth, okay? And a lot of these become cancerous. But right now, how we assess these is quite subjective and variable between people. Clinically, they can all look quite different, so it's not always clear. And under the microscope, they can have a very um, overlapping sort of pattern as well. So we start from the left side, which is the mildest or the um, best uh, behaved form of uh, pre-cancer. And on the right side, you've got cancer. So what we want to do is identify uh, these uh, things as 
early as possible on the left side so we can stop them from becoming cancer. But it doesn't help because the guidelines that we've got from the World Health Organization are very complex. We have to look at 26 different features in each piece of tissue and then try and identify whether how many of those are present, how much is present, and then try and give it a grade or a score, which may predict whether it will become cancerous or not. And it's not ideal and it's not great at predicting. So if we had a better tool, then perhaps we could do a better job of predicting something at an earlier stage with the hope of perhaps um, stopping it from getting a little bit worse. <laughs> and this is some work we've been doing, uh, which has been funded by Cancer Research UK, where we're using AI for pre-cancer detection. Uh, so you can see uh, the top left is your standard pathology image, but the other images are automatically highlighting and identifying those cells in the tissues. And what we can do is take away every single cell and do four to 500 different measurements on those cells, including their proximity um, and different types of features. And on the top right image, what you're seeing is a little heat map on this pre-cancer image. Again, this is work being done in collaboration with the group in Warwick. And the more red it is, the more likely or higher the risk of this pre-cancer is to become cancer. And right now, actually, we have a prediction accuracy of around 85 to 90 percent, whereas the human pathologist accuracy at best is 60 percent. So already we have surpassed uh, what we can achieve with the naked eye. But this is work under progress, so we, we are quite excited about it, and we hope to actually do a prospective or a live uh, study in the near future. But when we were presenting this patient to, uh, this work to some of the patients locally in Sheffield, they were like, yeah, that's all good, but when I went to my doctor or my dentist, they may struggle to identify and refer. So I need to be referred to a hospital for a biopsy, so can you do anything about the first step? So we started looking at the clinical photographs uh, of these patients, okay? So when we, uh, the patients are coming in, they're having photographs done, and we just thought, okay, even before the biopsy, can we use AI to actually predict whether something is suspicious or not? And this was uh, uh, just an AI model applied on uh, just the clinical photographs, and you can again see the red map, the more red, uh, the heat map, the red the lesion is, it's indicating that this is suspicious, this is pre-cancer or cancer, and this should be referred for a biopsy. So a really, really uh, good tool to help send patients to hospitals faster for a biopsy. And this has been covered in quite a few different sort of uh, venues, uh, our work, and uh, hopefully um, will make a difference. Just the last bit, uh, we know that some of the recent increases in head and neck cancer related to HPV status, and to establish that uh, we actually have to do some special testing. There are lots of different types of HPV. Uh, there's a cost, there's a time um, sort of implication of it as well. The testing may not be available locally, which means it has to be sent somewhere else, which means your treatment will be delayed. So we just thought, okay, can AI do something about this? And uh, for this work, we actually tried to develop some AI models. So on the top left, you've got a HPV positive cancer, and on the in the image next to it is an AI model predicting the HPV status of this cancer without the need to do the test. So just on the same image, you feed it into the model and will give you a score of whether it's positive or negative. And we've got up to 96% accuracy for this work. And it's just been published in Modern Pathology as well. So quite exciting uh, and hopefully will uh, we'll help patients in the near future. So summary, uh, as uh, Paul mentioned, the people, some people think the pathologist might be computers, so we're not, computers are pretty good, but I think the future is us working with computers to perhaps even get better. All of these technologies are going to complement and make us better and not replace us, and that's the way to look at these. It's going to make us faster and better, and most importantly, it's going to help us identify things within the, within the tissues which are going to help the patients. Uh, we can stop the cancers um, by identifying them early, or we can identify <laughs> hidden patterns in the tissue which can help the surgeons to treat them in a better way. Uh, thank you very much for listening. This is sort of a um, thesis of our research groups. If you are interested in learning more about it or in working with us, then just feel free to, to get in touch. And thanks a lot, and uh, we're happy to take any questions now. Uh, amazing. Uh, hope you're not putting yourself out of a job, though. Um. Yeah, everyone uh, keeps asking that. Oh, is AI going to replace pathologists? Especially if you hear about the scaremongering from Elon Musk and uh, talking to Rishi Sunak, yeah. that uh, people uh, will be replaced by AI. 
uh, but I don't think pathologists will be replaced. The reason for that is you can't hold an algorithm or a model responsible ethically, right? So these self-driving cars, if you had an accident, who's responsible? Is it the car or is it the software developer? Um, I think AI will not replace pathologists or clinicians, but it will replace clinicians who do not use AI. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Been, been warned. Are, are there questions for, for Ali and Paul? Yes. Interesting. Is that all? Me? Yes. Um, it was interesting how you were able to uh, emphasize the level of subjectivity that's needed in the early stages without the AI bit. Um, if you find cancer, you can then look more deeply at the appropriate slides. At what point, given the current state of play, before the AI is introduced, um, at what stage do you say, I've looked at enough tissue to know it must be okay? If you've not seen from your best bet samples that uh, there's cancer there, when, when do you draw a line and say, this must, this must be okay? I think there's a, there's a few different parts to that. Firstly, usually when we're making a decision whether it's cancer or not, it's a biopsy that we're looking at in the first instance. So you saw from the picture, it's quite small what we have. So we can, we can look at it all in those circumstances. Um, we, we have a technique we call leveling. So those really thin cuts from that tissue, when I say really thin, they're four microns thick, they're really thin. So if I've got a piece of tissue that's four millimeters thick, I'm only looking at less than 1% of it. And if we, the first bit that we look at, there isn't any cancer there, we keep cutting in deeper and deeper and deeper and seeing if there anything, if there anything is there. And um, what can be quite helpful is if we see a different disease process that's happening that can explain what the clinician's seeing. So that's really helpful. So if we see something else that explains the, the sort of uh, clinical manifestation of the lesion, that helps. Um, the other thing is cutting through it until we do see something. And alternatively, when we write these reports, um, I'm, I'm sure probably to the annoyance of surgeons sometimes, if we're not sure, we, we do express that and we do express that we're sat on the fence. And oftentimes we put it back to the, the surgeon or the clinician managing the patient and we'll say something along the lines of, there's no cancer here that we can see. If you're really concerned, please biopsy again and we'll, we'll keep looking. But it, it is difficult, and I've, I've had stories of colleagues where um, we cut that first little bit of tissue off and there's nothing, and then we cut the second bit of tissue off and there's nothing. And actually, it's only been once you get to, to level number 20 before you see the cancer. And it's sometimes really difficult to, to strike that balance of, obviously, we work in the NHS and we've got limited resources, um, and every time we cut another one, it costs about £30. So balancing that versus making sure we get to, get to the right diagnosis. Thank you. And if I may uh, um, take it from there, you've mentioned that AI is on the horizon, but currently, whatever AI has been used for medically thus far, not really applied to head and neck um, particularly. Do you have a sense of uh, time scale when some of that exciting work that you're doing may actually find its way into more day-to-day -day work of the pathologist? Very soon, hopefully. So in things like prostate cancer and breast cancer, AI and pathology is already being used. Um, so we're not that far off. Uh, I think it comes back down to the head and neck cancer not getting the same recognition or the same sort of awareness and funding like the other cancers. So that's probably why we've lagged behind. But the data we've got is really promising. So what we're hoping is in the next year or two that we can actually start doing some sort of a prospective study. So trying it on live patients and see how AI performs compared to an actual pathologist without changing anything to generate that further evidence. So yeah, I, I would think that in the next, I don't know, three to five years, hopefully you'll see something. I for one can't wait. <laughs> I have a terrific, I, my, my pathologist and I, we have a great relationship. Uh, the MDT is good, and just popping down to the lab is is a, a common occurrence. Um, and just sometimes, you know, it, it took a while to realise you, you're not machines. And I, you know, you think you take a sample, you send it off, I'll have an answer. And trying to explain to the guy, the lady you biopsied, 
I still don't know. You know, you've taken a whacking grape, mm. you've caused discomfort, you've brought them into hospital, and you have to do it again. And it, it happens a lot. And, and I, I would be fantastic if AI could find that little thing, and, you know, which, yeah. which is practically invisible. But I think one thing in the meanwhile that all of you probably should be aware of and is useful is that you can always ask for it to be seen by another pathologist. So we discussed about the variation and how one person with more experience might see something that someone else might not. So don't be scared or don't hesitate to ask for an external opinion from a center which has got a lot of specialists in that area. And sometimes I think that's always worth uh, exploring if you're not finding what you think might be happening. But yeah, we, we definitely think it's going to be a, a big help. Yes, Emma. Um, hi, thanks very much for your talks, they were great. Um, my question is around HPV positive status. So my understanding is that the increase in head and neck cancer is in part attributable to HPV positive cancers in young people. And we now, thankfully, have a vaccination program for both boys and girls. Hurrah. So, to my mind, to examine the impact of that vaccination program, we need to be tracking the number of HPV positive cancers. So my question is, do you as a pathologist routinely test for the HPV positive status? And if so, do you... <laughs> Did you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I heard you. Yeah, okay. fine. And if so, um, do you track it somewhere so that those numbers can be looked at? <laughs> <laughs> You're being naughty with your mic. <laughs> uh, thanks, Amma. It's a very good question. Uh, yeah, we routinely test for anything that uh, uh, is suspicious for. There's some features that you can see in the tissue which can guide you, particularly towards the back of your mouth and throat. We test for everything for HPV. And any, any cancer patient, any head and neck cancer patient, will go in a national sort of registry or database anyway. So they are tracked. Um, so in that sense, they are actually being recorded and tracked. One thing we're not doing is looking at the subtypes. There's more than 100 types of HPV. But we know that there's two or three common ones which cause head and neck cancers more so than, than the others. Uh, but we do have systems in place to actually capture that information. Okay. One more. Yeah, the gentleman. Yeah, hi there. Um, are you able to briefly explain the difference between recurrent cancer and persistent cancer? In that I had, after, about a year or so after my original treatment, they found another lymph node of cancer in, and everything was, the talk was recurrent cancer. But after I had the neck dissection, the oncologist said it was persistent cancer in a kind of a, almost a more positive way. Is there a, are you able to explain that? Because they couldn't really explain that. <laughs> um, persistent. Yeah, I, I guess actually might, what one, what I might call that as residual cancer. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, semantics and words. I, um, yeah, recurrent Kind of take residual cancer is the same cancer. You've it's come, you know, you've you've dampened it. It's not weed, you know. You thought you've got rid of it. Something's lurking there, some tiny cells, and it it comes back again. They've had or you've as a certain I've resected it, convinced I resected it. My pathologists have told me I've resected it, and I thought, oh great, and. Some time later, and, and I thought I was doing a really good job. And then, you know, I've had people you know, just five years down the line and get the bloody things back where I chopped it out. And it's sort of a time scale, but I, it, it's a bit semantics, kind of, because it must have been there all this time, is what I'm thinking. So it's a, it's a persistent or residual cancer, but it's five years later. And I guess the, the, um, sort of a recurrent cancer, you might think, is you might worry about another cancer get coming as well, because that's always a risk. Um, more so in the people, you know, in, in the ones which are P60 negative, you know, the ones if it's related to smoking and drinking. And that's why as an ENT surgeon, I, I bring people in for a panadoscopy to do PET scans and everything, because we're looking for a, not just that one cancer. So there's that risk, and that's why I keep an eye on people for five years, not just of the that one coming back, but maybe another one turning up um, because that risk is still there of the, of the smoking or bad luck. 
Um, there's risks, you know, cancers elsewhere. So it's a, it's a bit semantics, really, mm. to be honest. But it's whether it's the same one, and it didn't quite get rid of it. It was hidden somewhere, or it's a new one. Yeah, it's not always black and white. So mm. although what they think, uh, or on the scans, we're not seeing anything, and clinically we feel like we removed all the cancer and we're not seeing any actual cancer cells, at the DNA level or further beyond that line, some damage may have happened already or there might be cells in transit already between your tongue and your, your neck that we haven't removed. So we give it the best shot based on what information we have. And if we feel like it's clear that, okay, the tumor or cancer is not at the margins or it's not in the nose, then okay, it's removed. And then it comes back, then it's sort of a recurrence. Mm -hmm. But the residual is more like, yeah, we haven't managed to remove it all and it's still perhaps there and it's grown back to the same size, either after radiotherapy or chemotherapy. But yeah, it's basically just a bit of terminology. We tend to use residual perhaps more so than persistent. Does that help? Okay. Thank you. Next. Next is virtual. Both up here now. Philip again. Hey? I'm going to share this session, but it's you're going to go first anyway, so <laughs> I'm going to sit down in one of these comfortable king chairs. I feel like a king now. I shouldn't have a crown. You, and you can have my mask. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> it's no. very comfortable. No, no, no. We're actually working on next year's film. Um, and we're not going to announce where it is because we don't do that till tomorrow afternoon. But we're actually working on next year's film. And if you really want to laugh, you've got to go to next year's conference. Because if you think today's was funny, our chairman of next year, who is in the room, he's not going to divulge who he is. He will be having kittens at the moment, worrying. <laughs> anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in because I just love being cruel. It's <laughs> You got away lightly. Put it that way. You got away lightly with a mask. I did. Thank you. But anyway, over to you. Right. So next, have we got the? There you go. Is, and this is a virtual session, isn't it? It's a nice virtual. Device. It's a virtual session. They're doing it from prison. They're doing it from prison <laughs> off the M5. Off the M5. <laughs> Talking about cannabis. Yeah. They got as far as Wiltshire or somewhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. The place are still pretty high up in the mountains. Oh, no, that's the wrong phrase, isn't it? But one, yeah. Yeah. But it, yeah, but you'll find it interesting. Yeah. So county lines. No. Yeah. <laughs> so which is vir a virtual uh, discussion. I think we actually will find it find it incredibly interesting. Um, the old, old sort of using medical cannabis. Is, is what it's all about. There's a company, it's Simon Erridge, and I, and Derek. It's Simon's the doctor, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And then we'll go into Derek afterwards. We'll go into that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a special one. That's an extra. <laughs> He's out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, is he available? You're ready to go now. With there we go. I'm Dr. Simon Erridge, head of research at Sandby Clinics, and I've been asked to give a brief update around the evidence of medical cannabis and its use for people with chronic pain. Now we all understand that chronic pain is a highly prevalent condition estimated to affect up to one half of the UK population. Um, and within that we know that chronic pain commonly affects people uh, who have active cancer and those people who have gone through cancer treatments as well. And as the global population continues to age, we know that the, the prevalence of cancer is expected to increase, um, as well as that of chronic pain. Um, and you know, the subsequent impact that this will have not only on individuals but also on society at large as well um, is estimated to, to increase as well. So, talking today around medical cannabis, we really have to boil it down to the two major components of medical cannabis, and that's tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, and cannabidiol, CBD. And the main mechanism of action is on the central nervous system, on something we um, and one of the components of the central nervous system, we have done in a cap, is the endocannabinoid system. So within our bodies, we have a, an endogenous uh, cannabinoid system. So we have um, molecules that resemble those that look like CBD and THC, and receptors that act according to these. And tetrahydrocannabinols, THC, as I'll refer to it from now on, 
act predominantly at the cannabinoid type 1, CB1 receptor, um, whereas CBD uh, predominantly acts um, on the enzymes that break down the molecules that look like THC. Um, and as a result, they, they switch on or they activate the endocannabinoid system, which normally acts to dampen down signals between different neurons. And we can see here that cannabinoid receptors are predominantly distributed within the central nervous system, but actually they're found right throughout the body. Um, so they can be found in the immune system, the gastrointestinal tract, um, just to name a few. But um, THC and in particular CBD don't just act on the endocannabinoid system, they act on, on a range of different pathways. So you can see here in this diagram that CBD also acts upon uh, serotonin receptors, um, which we you know, commonly associate with babies in chronic pain, but also in um, psychological conditions, as well as um, a receptor called trip v one which again is um, heavily associated with the transmission of pain receptors, as well as the emotional um, modulation of pain. And we can see that here on this diagram in the, the cannabinoids and in addition to the other <coughs> pharmaceutical ingredients contained within medical cannabis products, have a multi-level effect from what we can see from preclinical studies on pain signals. They can act on the periphery to affect the transmission of um, you know, a painful stimulus and how that is transmitted to the spinal cord. They act within the spinal cord to dampen down those signals again uh, once they reach the spinal cord. And then finally, they have an effect in the brain of uh, modifying the emotional and cognitive manifestations of that pain. And so, as we can see here from preclinical studies, there is you know, a, a great suggestion as to why we want to look at it within humans. But what does the evidence say? That it's very uh, easy to, to you know, speculate from animal studies that um, you know, this might be an effective treatment. But we know that that is not always the case when we do research. And so what we do know about <coughs> research in humans is, is first there hasn't been enough of it, and there's, there's a number of reasons why that is, and we definitely need to have more research. But the most comprehensive um, research to date uh, on chronic pain uh, was, was published in the British Medical Journal in 2021. And this was a systematic review and meta-analysis um, combining all the studies to date to, look, to try and give a recommendation as to where um, medical cannabis could potentially be used for chronic pain. And they suggested that including people with cancer and non-cancer pain as well as other types of pain, um, there is a possibility of 10% um, likelihood of achieving a clinically significant change in pain severity um, for those people who are given non-inhaled medical cannabis products. This um, review also identified that there were differences in physical functioning as well as sleep. Um, and the, the overall recommendation that they came to was that if the standard of care had failed to provide a significant benefit for patients, then medical cannabis oils um, could be considered alongside standard of care. They also looked at the, um, the risks of medical cannabis, and obviously any medication is not without its risks. And they also showed that there was a small increased risk of cognitive impairment, drowsiness, and impaired attention. And we know from a number of other studies that there are more adverse events for, uh, beyond this associated with medical cannabis, but these are the key ones that were picked out. So how does that research fit in you know, with the current landscape in the UK? So at present, there are three licensed preparations of medical cannabis. Um, and only one of these has been licensed for use in cancer, and that's Navalone, which is a medication which is similar to THC and has been licensed for use in people with chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. Um, but otherwise, all other preparations for medical cannabis are unlicensed and were able to be prescribed um, from the 1st of November 2018 when medical cannabis was rescheduled. And the, um, there are a lot of restrictions around the prescribing of medical cannabis. Um, the first is that patients must have tried and failed to gain sufficient benefit from licensed therapies to be eligible for unlicensed medical cannabis. As we see, that kind of fits with, with the evidence from that study that was published in the BMJ, which suggests you know, it, it could be considered in those people who have failed to gain 
benefit from first-line treatments. It must also be prescribed by a consultant, and that's be a consultant in the relevant specialty, so a pain specialist for chronic pain, for example, and it must be approved by a multidisciplinary team. As such, most prescriptions are therefore written through specialist clinics, such as Sapphire, rather than by individual practitioners, although we are seeing um, a few um, people sort of operate uh, independently in the UK as well. In terms of prescriptions, in 2022 there were uh, 89,000 private prescriptions, and that is a per prescription, so the, the estimated number of, of patients is, is estimated to sort of be around uh, maybe 20 30,000 at that point. It may be slightly larger um, at present. Um, but as, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, actually fewer than five individuals have been successful in achieving NHS funding for unlicensed medical cannabis. So actually the dominant um, route of access is through specialist private clinics. Um, that's everything I want to talk to you through today. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and it was lovely, lovely to speak to you all. Take care. One of the biggest problems head and neck cancer patients go through is radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Plus they have various operations like neck dissections, reconstruction. And what they find then is post-surgery is lots of pain. And that pain can go on for many years after surgery and after treatment. And what we try and do here at The Swallows is look at all the different pain relief that's out there and the different products. In recent years, a more radical treatment has come to market and it's raising a lot of eyebrows and that's called cannabis. At last year's conference, I met some industry experts. So the next thing I know, I'm being invited by Cureleaf to go behind closed doors to look at the amazing world of cannabis. And I had lots of questions to ask. So Matty, just tell us a little bit about Curaleaf. Um, we're a, primarily a pharmacy that services medical cannabis for patients. Tell me a little bit, what is cannabis? If you strip it right down, it's just a plant. It's been around for thousands of years. There's so many active components present in it as well. There's so many people actually using it, and that's something we're here today to try and you know explore that and see if it's potentially useful for a lot more people in the UK because we'll have these legal channels as well now. Where does it come from? It, it's grown in a variety of countries um, and it's, it's shipped into the UK after um, it's a MHRA regulated body and they then manufacture it in the UK into the finished product and that's what our patients will receive. So is it legal? Um, it's been legal for five years, so I think it was the 1st of November 2018. It was legalised kind of on the back of a lot of young patients with epilepsy who were kind of having to fly out to different countries like in Netherlands, Germany to kind of get this medication that's vital for some people. So eventually in 2018 the government's decided to keep it as medical purposes. So what are the active components in cannabis? So at the moment, we kind of deal with two major components here in the UK and across most of Europe. So you have THC and CBD. So THC is the one that people probably have more awareness of in the illicit space because this is the molecule that's responsible for kind of the euphoric and high feeling associated with cannabis. Not to say that it doesn't have massive medical potential because it does. The vast majority of medicines in the UK market are THC containing. Whereas CBD, a lot of people in you know the general public space will have heard of it because it's a little bit of a fad at the moment, isn't it? You know, you have CBD in pretty much everything. Kind of we've seen it in like energy drinks, cosmetics, protein powders. You go as far as so it's responsible for so many different processes in your body kind of regulating your temperature your heart function uh, I mean I'll go on all day the list is it's getting longer all the time as well what are the different forms of cannabis and from a patient's perspective how the heck do I use them well the two main ones that you'll find um, would be an oral oil that you drop under your tongue 
And then there's the, the flower, the cannabis flower, which most people know as weed, if they've seen it on the street. So the oil would be your, your baseline. You take that regularly each day, and it, it, it's extended use. So you take it more in the night, and you get like a baseline, say a pain relief, that would last you the full day. Now, if you needed the instant relief, that's when the flower comes in, uh, into play. And that's very quick onset, it's a few minutes and you'll feel the effect, but it's very short acting. You would grind the flour like you would if you were gonna roll a, a joint, say. Set a measured amount out, put in this vaporizer, and literally you would take inhalations from this vaporizer device and it releases the THC, CBD. So people are gonna be scared when you talk about vapor. Is there any other forms? Yeah, so there's, there's actually an oral capsule um, which contains the equivalent dose of if you're using the oil, say, but it's contained within a, a solid capsule and you just swallow that. I mean, all of these products are unlicensed specials, which another name for that is bespoke. And I think the treatment uh, pathway for all patients is bespoke because no two patients are going to be experience the same thing along the whole journey. We're, we're using it to treat so many different conditions, but it doesn't mean to say for every single person, for every single condition, it's gonna work. So it's like me getting a headache. Aspirin works for me, yeah. but paracetamol don't. So just because I suddenly get this prescribed to me, it doesn't mean all my pain's gonna go away. Definitely not, no. And that kind of plays into the unlicensed role a bit as well. If you're deemed suitable for it, they're gonna say, look, try it. it it may really help you but it may not okay so i'm in one of those big farms yeah. the pharmacies that are on the high street and i walk in so they're going to prescribe it me they won't so they don't have much control over that the process really is you have to go through a clinic first to then qualify to go through the pharmacy after that so can i just go on the internet dot to google i want cannabis and just order it Definitely not, no. You, you know, you face, you face the consequences of that as an illegal substance, if not given out by a specialist prescriber. So, yes, you can apply for the process on the internet, but actually ordering the medication itself, it'll have to be kind of done through the proper medical channels. You don't know what it is, you don't know what if it's got pesticides in it, heavy metals, how it's being grown, what they're spraying on it as well. So I would say if you're not getting it from a medical channel, you don't truly know. We have to monitor, there's a maximum temperature, 25 degrees. How can medical cannabis benefit someone with head and neck cancer? Within the pharmacy that I work in, we have cancer patients um, and they tend to use it for nausea associated with if they experience chemotherapy for example, um, or anxiety around chemo or, and things like that, you know, so I mean it would be again a patient by patient basis doesn't prevent cancer, doesn't cure cancer, you know, we can't make any claims like that. But it can certainly benefit the symptoms surrounding that, those conditions. Good morning, you're through to Cumulee Pharmacy. Seth speaking, how can I help? So all of the team are trained on medical cannabis. We have had training from clinical members of staff. So they are all aware of the products that we have. They do have a lot of knowledge regarding that. So we do have staff at the end of the phone who they can speak to and they can talk them through the process or they can make payment for them over the phone. So from my point of view as, as a guy in the street, what's the patient journey? So you couldn't just walk into like a pharmacy, for example, when you've had your morphine dispensed and say, oh, I've heard about cannabis, can I have it? It doesn't really work like that. So basically what you have to do to qualify, you usually have to have had two failed licensed treatments or you know forms of care before you qualify for it. So for example, if you've had morphine, but you've just had morphine, it might be that you should try something else in the license space before that. So typically to start the process, it'll be the clinic that you have to contact. So any medical cannabis clinic that's available in the UK, I believe there's quite a few now. So they'll be the first point of call. And then once you pass the clinic stage, it'll then kind of go into the pharmacy side of care as well. A prescription lands on your desk. What do you do next with it? Once we accept that prescription on site, we put it in a basket, we pick the products, we do a few checks, we label it up, and then it gets a final check by one of the pharmacists or specialist technicians who can perform that final check. And once that's done, it hits dispatch. So it's boxed up, very plain packaging. We put in a sealed bag as well to protect from moisture and things like that. Um, and then our carrier will collect it that day and it'll be on its way to the patient.
So I've heard what you've said so far. Yeah. My simple question to you is, is it safe? Medical cannabis is considered, I would say, quite safe. The adverse effects that you deal with are often very minor in the doses that you use. So the typical ones, you'll have like changes in appetite, things like a dry mouth, drowsiness as well, some minor changes in mood. And then once you increase the dose, you kind of move more into the euphoric effects as well. So some people may get that, whether you want that or not, you know that's kind of something that's maybe considered a positive effect for some people as well. So is metal cannabis addictive? So I would consider the word addiction and use the word dependent as well. Um, sometimes used interchangeably, but yeah, we would say that medical cannabis has the potential to be, you know, for a patient to become dependent on it. Um, I believe that the data at the moment states around 9%, which is very similar to caffeine itself. So if you kind of strip that back and say, you know, the chance of being addicted to cannabis or dependent upon cannabis is the same as being dependent upon a cup of coffee. I've spoke to my friends and family since we've getting involved in this project and they straight away say, why are you having cannabis? They've dropped the word medical. We're in this industry and to us it's, it's bread and butter, you know, it's, it's a very um, just normal, normal thing to us now. But I mean, we are more than aware that there is stigma attached with cannabis use. I think everyone's still a bit shocked by it. They think, oh, is that legal? Are you allowed to do that? And I'm like, yes, it's very legal. I have to have a prescription. But I think everyone is its just amazed by it because I tell them all the stories of how much it does help patients. And then they can say, actually, yeah, it's a good thing. So does medical cannabis help with sleep? One of the main side effects that we kind of touched upon earlier is drowsiness. You know, insomnia is quite a large patient base in the UK as well. Cannabis is a really nice, another little, again, alternative medicine used for helping people to get some sleep too. So everything I've heard so far, I've got to ask the question, is it expensive? Can I get it through the NHS? Sadly, at the moment, it's a private service, so your consultations and the medication have to be paid for. So your pre-screening's nothing. So once you kind of qualify on the pre-screening, so I guess your pre-qualification, if you like, that'll be your consultation fee. So I think the average in the UK at the moment is around £50. So the physical um, prescription itself doesn't cost anything. It's when you pay for your medication on the prescription that is incurs the charge. Yeah, I can see we have received your prescription. And you will... A lot of our patients, head and neck patients, will, may have had some of their tongue cut off. They may have issues where they can't speak properly. Yeah. Of course, we, we would deal with that kind of thing daily. We do have patients who are like that. The, my team are very, very patient with speaking to our patients. We understand that each patient has different medical needs. If they aren't able to speak on the phone, we, they, we can do it via email or we have a live chat system as well. So they can go on and just send a message back and forth to a member of our staff. So I get this parcel through. But I haven't told any of my family that I've got cancer. I've not told any of my family that I've got problem. You pay for your medication, it gets sent out, you'll receive it in a very discreet package. So depending on what carrier they use, it'll just be a bog standard, you know, like a brown box with a carrier label on and then that'll be it. There'll be no more kind of said about it. It'll be very discreet too. For me personally, it's, it's great satisfaction to see, to see patients who have tried medical cannabis instantly. The way of life's changed. As the pharmacy team, that's what we cling on to, just changing people's lives for the better. We get a lot of, of nice feedback. Some patients tell us how much it has changed their life, how they've finally been able to play with their grandchildren or they've managed to go outside for the first time in two years. So thanks for a great day today. Um, learned so much more. Well again, I would just like to thank you for coming. It's been great. Um, hopefully it will uh, demystify a lot of issues for your patients and I hope they'll benefit from medical cannabis in the future. Um, and please, if you need more information, visit the Swallows website for more information. There will be leaflets available. Well, I hope that answers some of your questions. There's still lots and lots of mystery behind medical cannabis, but the guys at Cureleaf are really doing their best to raise awareness around this subject. In our world of head and neck cancer, let's hope they succeed. So I saw the presentation, very similar presentation like that, and I was speaking to the guys last year and to be fair, as a simple man like me, that previous slide before mine just goes above my head. 
I'm sure if you're an ac academic like Ali and Paul or you're educated like yourself, you know, a lot that sort of stuff, you must go to sleep being very excited looking at that. <laughs> me, it makes me go to sleep. So that's why I wanted to go and actually do that film because I wanted to bring it down to my level, if you like, and our level to just ask those very basic questions. And I don't know whether you guessed or not, but they are from the north. <laughs> they are from around Sunderland area. Um, when me and John turned up to do the film, and it was just a warehouse. There was a funny smell around, but we didn't know what that was. But it was just a warehouse, just a simple warehouse. We walked in there, and it was just an unbelievable experience. Um, and, you know, we even saw it, as you saw there in the labs being made. So after that, I decided I still get a lot of pain in my shoulders and my neck. And 12 years on, and I still get those pains. They damage the nerves on my arms doing the neck dissections. I can't play golf anymore. Um, can't do any of that, and I still get lots of pain. But I went there, and afterwards I thought, do you know what? My mum and dad used to say to me, stay off drugs, lad, otherwise you're in trouble. So I'm really anti-drugs, and to me, cannabis has always been a drug. So I decided to go down the pathway. I decided to apply, and I thought, well, they know me. It's going to be an easy ride. It's far from it. So I went through the whole thing. I had my consultation, which was free, generally was free, no different than anybody else. Um, I spoke to a doctor online who wouldn't talk to me until he got all my medical records from my GP. So he had my medical records there. I spoke to him. Um, it then went away to an MDT meeting where it gets discussed with four other doctors. And they came back and said, yes, you are eligible for medical cannabis for your pain. But I also threw in that I struggled to sleep. So I thought, if I'm going to have cannabis, I might as well go for it always. So I went for pain and sleep. And they prescribed me medical cannabis. But then I had, seven weeks ago, two heart attacks. And because I had heart attacks twice in two days, when I rang them up, they said, now you can't have it. The outcome was, though, I said, okay, so how much do I have to mortgage my house now for this a month? My prescription for both pain and for sleep was less than £30 a month to start me off. They start, were going to start me on a low dosage. And then once they then you try that, if it works, great, you're on the low dosage. But they may have to do it like all tablets, increase it slightly. But it was £30 a month. To me, that was affordable. Some people it might not be. But I thought to get rid of my pain and allow me to sleep for £30 a month, I was going to have to do this. And then somebody up there decided, no, you're not, Chris, because your dad, remember, said you're not having drugs. So they give me two heart attacks to stop me doing it. But the whole experience was very painless, very professional, and worth having a go. But, you know, when I then compared it to going on Dr. Google, I could have had the same prescription with no, in, no intro, no medical help or advice for £50 a month. And I could have had it instantly delivered the next day just through Dr. Google. I think I would rather have it for £30, knowing I've gone through it all properly, than £50, not knowing what I could do. They also had, in Sunderland, that we got took to a street corner where there was a guy on the street corner selling the same sort of stuff, and he was £70 a month. <laughs> so why are we going down that road when actually, if you're thinking about this as a topic, you've got to go down the right way? So that's my personal opinion, and what you decide to do is entirely up to you guys. We have got a Q&A now, and I think Matt's, Matt is on. So Matty, who you saw in the film that I interviewed, was very experienced, a, a great young lad. Um, what he doesn't know about medical cannabis really isn't worth knowing. So Matty, can you hear me? Hang on, he's on mute. No? Yes, I can. We just threw that one in because whenever you go on Google, everyone's always on mute. <laughs> so we just threw that in, Matty. So that was just, a, that was just me ab-libbing, so don't worry about that. It wasn't really. It was technical Sorry. issues. Um, but listen, thanks for uh, coming on today. Um, you obviously heard what I've said. It was great having that experience with you. Um, it was great going in those massive big 
thing safe with all those plants and seeing John then come out doing weird things with his camera, that was so, so funny. Um, we may have some questions, Matty, if that's all right. Yes, so we don't know how this is going to work, but please bear with us. We've done a rerun last night, well, a pre-run of this last night, and it took us two hours just to get this to say. So let's see if we can do it any better. And it's all down to the guys at the back, Matty, if it goes wrong. Not me, not Phil, not you. It's down to the guys at the back. So who's going to... There's got to be a question from some floor somewhere. Right at the back, please. Hi, Chris. Um, this question is actually for you, Chris, as a patient going through the pathway for medical cannabis. We heard earlier in the film that um, dry mouth can be a side effect of the uh, medical cannabis. And I seem to remember you in the past saying that you suffer from dry mouth. Um, was you like worried about the cannabis exacerbating the dry mouth that you already suffer from? My dry mouth is at a stage where it'll never get better. It'll never get worse. Saying that, we've got a great speaker on this afternoon who's going to fix my dry mouth going forward. Almost guaranteed, so you'll hear that later. But I have to then weigh up the pain I'm in, the lack of sleep against my dry mouth. I now know how to live with dry mouth. I now know how, what I have to do and what I don't do. So realistically, I'm no different than having a stub toe of all my life and you get used to it. So I don't think it was a problem. I never even, I have to generally say, I hold my hand up. Great question, because I even even thought of it. So it wasn't going to be a problem for me. It might be a problem for someone that's just going into dry mouth and not trying to understand it. But once you're there with dry mouth, as horrible as it is, we live with it. But I don't know, I can't answer that question honestly. It never, even across my mind, I wanted pain relief and I wanted to sleep. And Matty was going to make that happen for me. And if he didn't, then I'd be sleeping around his house. <laughs> so, a great question. Anything for Matty? Down here, please. Hello. Um, when you're recommending that patients inhale cannabis with a vape, uh, in head and neck cancer, one of the causes of head and neck cancer is smoking or potentially inhaling substances into their airway. So how do you, you, is that a concern, do you think? What's the evidence base for inhaling this substance? And does that have any risk with regards to causing cancer? Great question. It's one of the questions I asked Matt and I don't think it was on. Did you hear that, Matt? I didn't know. I didn't, that didn't pick up. <laughs> okay. If you remember, there was a couple of questions I asked you. One of them was about inhaling. And I'm, I don't, I've never smoked in my life, ever. And the last thing I was ever going to do is stick something in my mouth and try and breathe something into my lungs for that very question. And also with the awareness I do around head and neck, I would just want to... And I, actually, and I know there's an answer. So the question was, inhaling, then what's your thoughts about inhaling and whether it would then encourage more cancer? And what's your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, from the data that we've seen, the, the way that you typically inhale cannabis in a medical sense compared to, you know, I think Adam had mentioned this, our pharmacist briefing on the video was saying, some people typically assume you kind of roll it in a, you know, like a joint or something conventionally, but the way that you have to vaporise cannabis, it's under a approved medical device, so it's, it's the same as, you know, an inhaler, for example, it's got that same state that's in the eyes of the regulators, so it's controlled temperature, you just use a dry flower, there's no, you know, kind of nicotine tobacco products or anything going into that, so it's just a full plant heated at a controlled temperature so you're not kind of combusting it, so everything's, like, well, like I say, controlled, so you shouldn't really get any negative benefits, but I understand that some people may be a little bit more sceptical of inhaling anything, you know, you could, you could argue that there may be some adverse events from inhaling kind of any product, so this is why we have all the dosage forms available, such as kind of your, your capsules and your sublingual oils. Um, as the kind of sector grows and the evidence and research improves, I feel like we'll start to see a lot more kind of conventional dosage forms, so you know, things like it, Astactin tablets for people who may not, you know, qualify for something like vaping a product, so this, I think they're going to have all bases covered very soon, but the industry is still very much in its infancy in the UK, so I mean, it's an exciting time for me to be here, but yeah, I think 
just watch the space over the next couple of years and we'll start to see a lot more kind of positive innovations come out as well. But also when we were there you were working on a pastel I believe as well. Yes. Yeah, I know you can't say much about it, but it does that answer your question? That was my concern, was about anything smoking, inhaling. If I'm inhaling, I'm smoking. So the tablet form or the... No, is it just the inhalation? Yeah, then? but do you think that answers the question by not have doing that, but you could do it in another yeah, format? Yeah, 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 perfect. i tell you what though, he must be the most popular guy in clubs on a Saturday night, mustn't he? <laughs> He's handsome and he works in cannabis, legally. But anyway, any other question? Yes, down the front, can we have a mic, please? If you can just say your name and you know, what you do, and then Matty yeah. goes, so he know, knows that he's not talking to the police. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Sophie. Um, I'm here from the Oral Health Foundation. So kind of leading on from um, what the other lady said is we have quite a, not strong stance, but firm stance on, like, anything that sh is put in the mouth that shouldn't naturally be there, we kind of take a stance against it. So if someone is maybe leaning towards like cannabis treatment but do they have the option of say oh I don't want to have anything that can be inhaled I'd rather have a capsule or what kind of input do they have in the way that it's prescribed or would you kind of say no for you it has to be inhaled or it has to be um, drops under the tongue which again um, like inhaling we wouldn't necessarily advise but obviously it depends for every person but um but yeah, is, is, do they have autonomy in how it's prescribed? Matty, did you hear yeah, that? Of course. Yeah, yeah, it is. So thanks, Sophie. Yeah. Basically, yeah, you have total autonomy at the kind of consultation stage. So the specialist consultant will kind of review that with you and, you know, he'll discuss kind of your outcomes and what you want from the treatment, really. So at the stage, if someone, again, like they're a bit apprehensive about using a vaporized or inhaled product they will kind of explore the other dosage forms and then you know kind of assess the risks and benefits at that stage so just because you get put on say one product for your first month if you don't have benefit from it you know immediately they sometimes keep you on it for an extra month but then if you still kind of aren't fine and any real benefit from it then the conversation opens up to kind of change in alternative dosage forms as well but yeah so it's all kind of not patient-led but it's heavily discussed by the patient so you have true autonomy of what you kind of want out of it as well. So one of the things I said to my consultant was, I didn't want to smoke anything. That's something I said. And, and he did. my consultant did actually say to me that inhaling, it's a quicker effect because it goes into the system quicker. But when I said, no, I didn't want to have it, he then talked about other dosage and, and, and obviously other types. And he slightly adjusted my dosage accordingly because I was going to take a tablet format. But if I'd have inhaled, it would have been a lesser dosage because it would have been in quicker. That's right, Matty, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And one more question, if you don't mind. And is there anyone? Or oh, second row. <laughs> this looks a good one. This does look like a police lady. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello, Hilary. I'm a, from a head and neck patient cancer support group. Um, I'm very grateful I don't have a lot of pain to deal with, but I know patients within our group sometimes are dealing with pain what practically how do they go about if they finding out if they're suitable do they have to go via their head and neck teams or can you go online and apply to see if you're suitable how practically do they do it just because i'd like to be able to take that information back so Matty, yeah of course Matty, you answer that and then i'll tell them what the swallows is doing oh, that's great yeah so i guess from a patient who's just heard of medical cannabis kind of just want to find out a bit more there's to be fair dr google's a very good friend so there's i think it was mentioned in the video there's several medical cannabis specialized clinics have kind of popped up now and kind of prior to being eligible they often have a pre-screening so this is where you'll submit you know if you've what medications you've taken the conditions you have kind of any other medical history etc and at that point the clinic will assess whether you're eligible or not so they're not going to just take your money off you straight away if you like they will make sure that you're on a higher likelihood of qualifying so if someone has had no medical history and just wants to try and get medical cannabis 
they'll submit the form and then they will get rejected at that stage based upon not being eligible so yeah a lot of the clinics that are offered online as most of them are now because of covid they kind of all have this pre-screening so you have to go through that first but it's normally quite a straightforward one pager or two pager exercise to submit the information do a bit fact finding and then you'd be invited to a consultation if you're eligible at that stage yeah so the swallows won't get in collaboration with anybody unless i personally or one of the team have been out there seen it and been around so that we can really recommend it. So on our website, we're currently building a page all around medical cannabis. So a patient can go on there and be referred. We are linking with CureLeaf because we've been there, seen it, and we believe that they do the right job. But like all adverts say that there's hundreds of others, but we've been there and seen it. Um, so over the next couple of weeks, there will be something on our website that will give them a link direct to these guys and they will do the same path as I did. They will have that conversation not initially with one of the girls. The girls then will organize the first meeting with the doctor online. And then it depends where they want to go. You can go all the way through and even get a prescription in your hand and decide not to do it. But I would rather work with someone that we, and their doors are always open. So if your group wanted a day trip, which is a great day trip by the way, um, up to there then we can organize it you can go and have a look around it's in, an incredible setup but yeah I, I'd rather do that or last time I was in Benidorm there's a pub that queue around the door that gets little packs for 25 euros but I think I'd rather take our option so I'm gonna move on if you don't mind unless I'll, if so we've got time for one more question where are we up to where's my timekeeper All right, that's fine there. We've got plenty of time. Ten minutes is fine. So we'll move on. But I hope you enjoyed that because I thought that was important to bring that to the audience. And I hope you really enjoyed it. So we'll move on to the next. Matty, you're a superstar. Enjoy Thank your weekends now. <laughs> yep, great. Thanks, Chris. And if um, anyone needs my details, I think Chris has got them. If anyone's got any further questions, Cheers, just Matty. give us a shout. Uh, Thank you. Right, Cheers, Matty. Up. All the best. What a great young lad. Unbelievable. Um, so can we move on this in fact I'll give you a couple of notices because I got told off so there's no alarm this today <laughs> if you hear an alarm follow me Sharon or Tom because they're you know they'll, they'll just be running for an exit and just get out of the building um, toilets are out there and somewhere <laughs> just find it um, so that's the two main ones I forgot to tell you about we also have around the, the, the room today and in the other room live artists from our local university. So if there's any in the room, did you just want to stand up a minute? I think there's one over there drawing, over there. There's one over in that corner drawing. We've also got two um, um, young students that are doing media. And rather than give a pretend project to work on, they've been given a real project to work on. So please don't treat them any different than you treat our trainee cameramen. Um, you know, if they ask you for an interview, don't be easy on them. They want to learn. They want to understand what, what it's all about interviewing people. But, you know, give them the, the chance to get some real experience. I think this is a great opportunity for them to really do it. When we've done it in Nottingham, we have two students that were there and now working in the NHS in using their art to move forward with medical science. So it does, you know, one of these guys could be our next game changer. So give him a chance. So a round of applause for those because they've turned up on their own time. <clears throat> and, the, and the young man that looks after him is stood over there, sitting down over there. So again, um, if you have any questions, please see him and they're willing to talk to you. Um, there's a book in the other room when you go for your coffee break, which is this one. Stories of, a, of Cancer and Hope. The writer of this is a patient, obviously. It's not all about head and neck, it's about his cancer journey. He sent us about three boxes and they are free. Don't take half a dozen. I know that some of you in the room will be taking boxes and boxes. Just take one, but they're free, take them. Otherwise, we've got to take them home. So please take them. Um, Mo, where are you? Mo at the back is a patient. I've known him now since we've done Nottingham days. That's actually his radiotherapy mask. I don't know whether you noticed Mo up on there. Um, 
And he's also a singer who's going to entertain you. And he's got his, wrote his own song and he'll be entertaining you through the break. So thank you very much, Mo. Um, what else have I got on here? In that room as well, there's not many bottles, but there's a new product I've just bought over from America, which is seawater. And it's, it is just salt and seawater. And it's a mouthwash. And in America, they are having great results for curing sores in the mouth. There's not many there. If you take a bottle, all I'd ask you to do is take it, try it, and just give me some feedback so I can then report back to the, to the company in America. So we have got more coming, but customs, because we're out of Brexit, but hey, am I political? No. But we're out of Brexit, they're stuck in customs. So only one box comes to it. Six came at the same shipment, one got out and five are still in. It's a bit like the cannabis. So, but, you know, whoever decided on Brexit, that's another argument, and it? it's not going to be one for today. But please take a bottle, but just give me some feedback. All right. Um, so, and now we're going to finish off before your lunch break, and I hope you've got tears. Our carers are important. Any carers in this room? Okay, without our carers... We as head and neck patients wouldn't get through this journey. And without our carers, the NHS and the medical system would implode. So we, uh, we really do trust and re appreciate our carers. Last year we'd done a session. This year we're just going to run a film. One of our carers has done a film to present to you today. And I'm guaranteed that the tissues will roll. <laughs> and then you can go and have a cup of coffee and have a bit of laughter. But this is the only time when laughter is not appropriate. And you'll listen to his story, and then we'll go for coffee. Uh, thank you, Chris. And Good evening, or good morning, good afternoon, wherever you happen to be in the world. It is not my intention this evening to talk to you about the role of the carer, but instead I thought I would share my journey and experiences with you and allow you to decide for yourselves what, if any, help or assistance we should be giving and considering and more importantly delivering to carers during this extremely stressful and emotional time whilst they support the patient through their cancer treatment. I'll start by posing two of the many questions that have been uppermost in my mind since I became directly involved with head and neck cancer. When does a family member of a cancer patient become a carer? What triggers a change of mindset from gently supporting the patient, accepting the situation as it is, to one of direct action. Well, I guess the answer to those questions are different for all of us as we embark on our individual journey down the cancer treatment highway. So, here is my story, told briefly and entirely from my perspective as the carer, and recognising that mine and Jane's personality may be completely different to yours, thereby possibly causing you to opt for alternative solutions in similar circumstances. Both mine and Jane's personal strengths and weaknesses had a huge influence in the choices we made and the manner in which we went about achieving our aims. I make no claim whatsoever that my decisions and actions to the circumstances I faced are right or wrong. They are just the choices I made at a time when emotions and stress levels were inevitably at an all-time high. I cannot in any way be described as a natural carer. I have to work really hard at the softly, softly approach. I'm much more comfortable in the all-out sort of Geronimo style. Fortunately, I am reasonably well de domesticated, so running the, uh, the home, shopping, cooking, etc. were not going to be a problem. All these things, along with driving my wife to and from appointments, just replaced 
all of my social activities. So my answer to the two questions I posed at the start of this presentation. When does a family member of a cancer patient become a carer and what triggers the change of mindset from a gentle supporting role, accepting the situation as it is, to one of all out action? Well, it is, I believe, simply at the moment of diagnosis. Until that time arrives, you desperately hope that he will not be cancer. And I spent most of my time talking to Jane gently of positive outcomes and minimal life impact, whilst inwardly and silently planning for the worst possible result and the potential necessary actions. So here's the first problem we carers have to balance. Displaying a cool, calm, supportive exterior to our patient whilst dealing with a volcano of emotions internally, which are constantly spewing out a lava of nightmare scenarios, not least of which may be the loss of our spouse or partner, parent, child or friend. From the moment of confirmation in Jane's case, it was mouth cancer, I uh, took control of our daily lives. I managed our diary. Uh, there were going to be lots of appointments and I would be alongside her at all of them. I also took on board a lot of the household chores, which had previously been abdicated to my wife. However, I was also trying to keep her active and stop her from negatively dwelling on her own situation. So it was important, in my view, to keep her involved as much as possible in normality, for as long as possible. And of course, I did become her cancer-related emotional comfort blanket, taking on board and dealing with the worst of her fears and concern while suppressing my own, well, certainly in her presence. So problem number two now raises its ugly head. Who do I turn to with my worries and my concerns? I can't help feeling that my issues are insignificant compared to hers. And of course, rightly so, all the medical contacts are focused on the patient and their needs. An occasional, and how are you coping, thrown in the direction of a carer, usually in the company of the patient, can only elicit a standard carer's response of I'm okay, thank you. When what you really want to share is the emotional turmoil you have found yourself thrown into by this terrible diagnosis that your loved one is not always being straightforward when asked questions by medical staff that they are minimising what you as the carer see at home in a mistaken effort to not add unnecessarily to the burden of the overworked medical teams. And that you feel you cannot speak freely in front of the patient for fear of increasing their already heightened emotion, emotional and stress levels. The carer needs some alone time with the medical staff to discuss these issues. And the medical staff need to recognise that they are not treating just one patient, patient with cancer but two, or possibly more. When planned treatment is cancelled for whatever reason, there is an inevitable feeling of at best disappointment and at worst despair. I found myself in a scenario of three cancelled surgeries. Two on the day of the surgery after being fully prepped. And as time went by, we lost over five weeks from the first planned surgery. The tumour continued to grow, visibly, on the inside of Jane's face. I felt I had to take some positive action. I could no longer accept waiting at home for a telephone call that seemed never to come, offering us that new date for surgery. I was being drained of my energy reserves by constantly having to reassure my wife that it will be soon. 
when I truly believed we had been abandoned. I had no one to share these thoughts, worries or concerns with. So I developed the ability to compartmentalise these negative issues and only share the positive ones with Jane. All of my negative feelings were channelled into an action plan, primarily directed towards the system that seemed okay with our plight. Our lives were on hold and time was fast running out. Make no mistake, I was angry. I felt crushed by the lack of interest from the hospital in Jane's worsening condition. I had exhausted all the normal channels of action and my anger and frustration was at boiling point. I needed to vent. I made the decision to contact the press and arranged an interview in regard to this intolerable and unacceptable situation. Two days later, our story was front page news. It took the hospital less than 24 hours after publication to arrange an appointment for my wife to be reassessed by a different surgeon who did indeed recognise the need for urgent action. And the date was confirmed with both the surgeon and senior administrative staff for early January 2019. During this meeting, I worked very hard on my self-control, as I knew these people held our future lives in their hands. I actually wanted to rant and rage at them, but it would not have achieved our goal. So I was massively relieved with the result of that meeting, and Jane, who had been slowly sinking into despair, visibly and mentally responded positively to the news. Although I still could not shake off that feeling that too much time had been lost and all our plans and hopes for the future were in jeopardy. Despite a positive result, I was actually left with nowhere to target or discharge my anger and frustration. And so once again, I compartmentalised it and took it home with me. Our journey from then on followed a path that I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. Daily and sometimes twice daily, 30 mile round trips to the hospital. Jane was actually an inpatient for 29 days. And then planning for the radiotherapy treatment which would follow discharge after giving her time to recover from the massively invasive surgery she had already undergone. Before radiotherapy could commence, we had to deal with infection issues, which required further hospitalisation for four days, and a poorly fitted peg feed, which did not function correctly and had to be changed. Throughout this time, I spoke only of positive outcomes and how we would look back on this time as one of life's great hurdles, which we had successfully cleared. All of this activity, whether good or bad, helped keep me focused and stopped me from falling into a black hole of despair, although my emotional compartments were fast filling up and it would soon be time to empty the trash. My nagging fears that this had all taken too long. I pushed into one of my compartments labelled oversensitive issues <laughs> to be deleted at a later date. 30 sessions of radiotherapy were planned, confirmed in the diary, and an appointment was made to fit the mask for which a scan was required. It was this scan result that shattered my entire world. A second tumour had developed very close to the location of the original tumour, and as a result was diagnosed as both inoperable and terminal. I heard all the words being spoken, but I was having a massive problem assimilating them. 
I needed to ask all sorts of questions. I needed more information. I needed to know why this had happened. I needed to deal with this, but not right now. The shock was too much, and certainly not with Jane sitting right next to me. I needed a future opportunity to discuss with the doctors how had we arrived at this point and where we went from here. But instead, we were almost in haste, shuffled out of a room and told to go home and await the contact from the district nurses. I was just too stunned to resist. All the fight had indeed drained out of me. I felt like I was ethereal, uh, watching myself in a, in a theatre production from a distance. Not comprehending, but somehow understanding that this production was about to lower the curtain for the last time. Quite how I managed to keep the car on the road during that journey home, I don't really know. But by the time we made it home, I had a new anger building inside of me. And one that would keep me focused until the day I held Jane's hand in the hospice. And she suddenly, but gently retired from life. And I hope started a brand new adventure. I am still dealing with my own issues resulting from Jane's diagnosis and passing. But I do find the monthly Swallows meetings a great comfort, not from any morbid sense, but from the hope that by giving another carer the opportunity to open up and share some of their deeper thoughts and emotions and frustrations, which under normal circumstances they may feel unable to speak out aloud. Together, we just might make a small but positive difference to the quality of both our lives. Thank you. So guys, that was a wonderful Derek, and he's still part of the Swallows, he's massively part of the Swallows. Um, it brings a tear to my eye every, <coughs> every time I hear it. Um, <laughs> But it's important that we listen. Because unless we do listen, we can't help care us. So please, take that aboard. It's the only time we don't do laughter is the best medicine. Because that's reality. And carers need our support. Carers need health officials out there. Make sure caregivers are given that chance. Philip, if you take anything back... Take that back in, and next time you see a carer, give him that opportunity. Because all Derek wanted, believe it or not, he's an angry man, he's a lot better now. He just wanted someone to take him to one side and say, shout and scream at me, Derek. Please shout and scream. But no one did. And I think that's such, such a shame. You know, I don't know how me and Sharon didn't get divorced through our journey. I was horrible too. I took it out on the one I loved the most, and I think we all do. And I think it's so important that we all realise that as hard as Derek talked there, this is reality and we need to be aware of it. Um, he was going to come here and deliver that himself. But again, he finds it very hard because he still wants to rant and rave. And it's not fair. He wants to then channel it into more positive stuff. He's raised over £10,000 for the Swallows in his wife's name. Um, He's an incredible guy. And I thank him, and I think he deserves a round of applause. <clears throat> so, we're going to go for a coffee break, but we have got a competition going on today on Twitter. Tom, me lad at the end there, is judging it. If you put a, if you put a photo on Twitter and you use the Twitter handle... It's on all the documentation, hashtag HNCCONF2023. A prize will be picked out, and there's a prize at the end of each day for the best photo and best tweet. It doesn't always have to be funny. It can be what it is, but he chooses, um, and he's not got a great sense of humour, so you'll be all right if it's not funny. Um, so, only kidding, Tom. So, please, start posting. Um, last year, we... Trended at number three on Twitter. 
which isn't bad going considering we're only a small little support group based here in the UK, but across Twitter alone, we trended at number three on the hashtag last year. It'd be nice if we can get to number one, but I need everyone to tweet and everyone to use that hashtag. So please, please, please get photos on. And I hope you've enjoyed the first session. Go for a nice cup of coffee, dry your eyes, and we'll see you back in here soon. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, we have two speakers here, please, about the latest technology in head and neck. Um, uh, we have Richard Cave uh, is, is speaking <coughs> first. Uh, speech and language therapist trained. Guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. But as I say, something incredibly sort of close to heart for me as a head and neck surgeon with voice banking and what well, is spending a whole lot better than I was. Richard. Well, hello everyone. I, you know what? It was so inspiring the presentations all of them this morning that yeah, I ended up rewriting a lot of my present presentations. So, the first thing I want to say is I want to say thanks to Chris and, and the Swallows team because this is an amazing, amazing event. And you know, I've, I've come, I'm a speech and language therapist, I work in many areas, but I'm so delighted to be here to uh, be learning. And you know, um, I was listening to the carers present presentation and I came to the conclusion that you know a lot of people that say talk is cheap and they couldn't be any more wrong. They could not be any more wrong. And what we need to do as speech and language therapists is we need to help people to communicate and keep talking, particularly when things get difficult. Because we know from the evidence that when things get difficult, social networks are at risk. And people just drift away, not because they want to, not because they mean to, but just because it gets harder and things just happen that way. And just when people are the most vulnerable, when they want to talk, when they want to share something important, many important things, when they want to do the small talk, when they want to just talk about stuff, but about not being ill, about stuff, we need to protect that. That's important. The small talk, it's really big, really big, that's the stuff. So my name's Richard, I'm a speech therapist. And I've, I've had various careers like most, most of us here. I spent, I spent my four formative years working in IT. I worked for Dell for 12 years. And then I saw the light. And I retrained and I became a speech therapist. Because I felt there was something more to technology. Because at the end of the day, technology is about people not the other way around. It's all about people. And I was just listening to that AI. AI, you can't get rid of that term. It's literally everywhere. And just last week I was chairing a, one of the conferences uh, at Royal College of Speech and Language Therapy annual conference. And it's about AI. And there's all this question about where does AI fit in speech and language therapy? Like, where does AI fit in pathology? Where does it fit? And we are looking at that, and there's lots of just discussion. But at the end of the day, AI and speech therapists and pathology and all of your professions, it's all about people. It's all about us. Because the underlying of AI, the data underlying AI, is about us. That's how AI just collaborate, collates huge amounts of data at the end of the day, it's us. So, we can use it. I, I feel positive about AI. People at the speech therapy conference said, will it take my job? It will not take your job. Because speech language therapy, along with the, with the professions that you work in and the people who you are, it's all about people and AI will help if we make it so. The big problem with AI is that it's already here and there's lots of people doing stuff and we are not involved yet. We need to be. It's powerful and we need to be involved. For us, for you, for our friends, for communication, all the stuff that makes us us, we need to engage with AI. So I work part-time with Google on automated speech recognition technology. This is stuff that's in our lives. Hands up anybody that does not have a mobile phone. No one. We all have 
we have ASR automated speech recognition on our phones. And if you're anything like me, my phone is kind of almost my life. It's like, it's in my pocket. There's so much important stuff on there. And ASR, speech recognition, Siri, Alexa, I hope I won't trigger your phones. <laughs> Google, Google Assistant, Cortana, all the others, they have hundreds of thousands of uses. Like Alexa, the last count a few years ago, had more than 100,000 different uses. 100,000. And in our daily lives, you know, we can get directions, we can ask, we can play the latest Beatles single, we can, we can do all sorts of things, we can do important stuff on our phones just by talking to it. And for, for certain of us, in me included, as a kind of slightly older generation person, I, we did not grow up with that technology. So it doesn't come naturally that this stuff is here and free and on our phones. For the younger folks, you, you've always had this stuff. You've always grown up with it. It's just there and, and you use it. The big challenge for us is that as we get older, stuff like voice access and voice control gets more important because there are physical changes. And actually having voice to control stuff like your room, your lights, who's at the door, open, opening the door, finding out stuff, using voice could be really important. It's the difference between autonomy and having to get someone else to do it. And I vote for autonomy. I vote, I'd like my stuff. I'd like to do my stuff, my thing. I'd like to do myself, thanks. There's one problem with automated speech, like recognition, a few. But the main problem is, it only works for standard voices, as defined by big technology. Which by converse means for non-standard voices, it doesn't work. Which is really annoying because for people with non-standard voices, all this stuff, all this environmental control, all this access, all this communication, all this stuff is just simply not available. And you'd be surprised about how many people have non-standard voices, or maybe you wouldn't. Significant accents. People from cultural com communities who have their own words, who like to say things in a certain way that is not recognized by the large language model as defined by big tech. And many people living in the head and neck cancer community. Because of surgery, because of laryngectomy, voice changes, speech changes, and that's that. And that's it. You know, and one of these things is that when voice and speech changes for any reason, could be surgery, it could be, it could be anything, then often there's a sense of identity change as well. People feel, often feel slightly different about themselves. I'm not saying it's anyone here, but in the, in the, in the evidence space, feel, sometimes feel a bit different about themselves, about their sense of identity. And also people around them feel that it's, it's, it's different somehow. And so the interesting thing, and I feel, I feel like I shouldn't be pointing this out, but I have to, to lots of people, not in this room, but voice change is not linked to competency. There is no link at all. We're not talking about competency or skills or anything like that. And yet often people think that. People, and so that's a speech and language therapy mission, to just let everybody know. We're not talking about, it's not that. It's not that. But one of the most important things at Google is, is my job at Google is to be inclusive, inclusive, so that people with head and neck cancer, lar laryngectomy, all the rest of it, come in, come in to the project and they say what they say. Because although I'm hired to have an opinion, which is usually at odds with other people within Google, it's much better coming from you. So I try and bring people in that they've never spoken to. Because if Google are writing stuff like automated speech rec recognition for people like us, then they need to involve us. They can't guess. And yet there are some very bright people, very smart people, and they, you know, they would benefit from our skills. In truth, they would benefit from our superpowers because we know you know 
about speech and communication change, and they don't, even though they're paid a lot of money, and they're half our age, and they're super bright. <coughs> but we know. And so the most important thing is, for me, is to get everybody together in a room, virtual, actual, and to talk. Keep talking. Talk is not cheap. This can be the answer. So AI, in my view, is about getting everybody together and using it for the best for all of us. And I think this is an ongoing discussion that we have. None of my slides have come up, but that doesn't matter. That just doesn't matter. So um, we developed a tool called Project Relate. Oh, look. This. Oh, isn't that great? So, Project Relate is a free tool. It will always be free. If you have an Android device, you could download it right now. It's free. And the idea behind it is to make speech recognition work for everybody. So you can train a personalized speech recognition model on your own phone and use it the way you want to use it. And it's, and it's here. It's been in the UK for a year. No one's heard about it because people just, people, I'm just saying people, put stuff onto the Play Store and think the job is done and it's only really just started. And um, those are my contact details, by the way, if you've got any questions. Um, and the idea is that you train the model, but it gives you phrases. You're asked to repeat 500 phrases in the way that you talk today. No special efforts, just talk, just talk normally. If there are any clinicians in the room or any professionals, I recommend you do it too, just to see what, what it is. Uh, you have to do 500 minimum. And what's more important is that you can train this speech recognition model, not only for the way you sound, but the words you say. And this is really important because Google, using large language model, whatever that is, it will probably not know the names of people, places, and things that are in your lives. So you need to train Project Relate, and you can do that. So you train it, and then after 500 phrases, within a couple of days, you get a personalized speech model downloaded to your phone. And it can do four different things. The first thing is it will try to transcribe your speech as you speak in conversation in real time. It captions your speech as you talk. It may not be perfect, but it could help. I mentioned I'm doing a PhD at UCL, and it's all on this. And the question is, how accurate do the captions have to be to be effective in conversation? The interesting thing is that it may not be as accurate as you think it needs to be. Because what this does is it supports everything else that you're doing. You're still talking. You're still looking at people, doing the gestures, the pause, the emotions, smiling, everything. All of that is unaffected in real time. This is captioning. It may not need to be accurate, because a lot of the time people understand you anyway, and if they do have a look, it may help. Uh, the, the other thing it does is speech in, speech out. So if you're in a coffee shop or saw something like that, you say something and it will repeat in a synthetic voice there and then. And the third thing is it allows you to go directly onto Google Assistant. So you sp say something and it will go and search for you. So you have all of that world available to you. And the fourth thing is that you can use it as a keyboard. And this means that Whatever app you have that has, that has a keyboard, you can use your distance change speech. And that's important. So I'm, I'm, I work with a man living with Parkinson's in East London. He has changed speech, and it's difficult for him to use a keyboard. And he's writing a book about his life. And what he does is he opens Google Docs. It could be Microsoft Word, whatever. And he starts talking. And he shared the doc with his wife. His wife does the editing and proofreading and comes back to him and says, is that what you mean? And they get things done. Is it functional? 
Well, they're, they're doing it. And I hope his book, he's, he is a, an ex-journalist and he's like a super interesting guy. So I hope it, I hope it comes out. Um, I would like to show you a video. <coughs> I'm sure this this will this will work. It'll work. <laughs> Lives with Lange X, of course, and, and, and Electra Lange. This She delivered the keynote speech at the International Association of Lange earlier this year using this. And um, she spoke for 10 minutes, and we had the captions on the big screen. Um, and I think, you know, kind of, it, it, it's, it's not the golden bullet, this technology, but it could help. And for somebody with a speech that has changed, like Deborah, she was able to train the model not only for her regular words, but for words like R2D2, I mean, and puff the magic dragon, and all these other phrases. So we, you know, it was work because we had to, she had to train how she says those words. But at the end of the day, there, were, there was a room full of people like this, and, and I asked, you know, raise your hand if you felt the captions were helpful. In fact, why don't you raise your hands if you think the captions helped you understand? Yeah, gosh, thank you. I just wish I had my camera. <laughs> thank you, yes. And actually, that was exactly what happened there. And, you know, the interesting thing about Deborah was that I got to meet her because she, she went on these conference calls, like this Google Meet call, and the background noise reduction cancelled her voice. It cancelled her voice. I was just like, and, uh, and she called up Google and she said, what's going on? My voice has, has gone because of your background reduction. And eventually went to all sorts of people and then it came to me. And I spoke to her and we worked on it, worked on it, fig figured it out and the engineers are going to figure it out. But because of her, I learned an awful lot and we ended up doing that. So it's just one other person. <laughs> Because it, it was kind of we had my own little, like, I already had my like, sister or family member who my birth that if I had a problem, they, they could tell the person what I'm talking about. Well, now I have it in my pocket. So I just take it out and I tell them what I want and what I need. And it's very easy um, to gain that confidence in, in doing everything that I want to do in my Yeah, so um, that's Bill. He has a different type of voice change, but I just wanted to show you kind of the kind of voice changes which, you know, and, and I reflected, I was so, I felt so honored to listen to the Carer Press presentation because it reminded me just how important, how important the swallows is, but how important it is to, for people to keep talking, particularly through the difficult times, and anything we can do with technology to help people to do the important stuff. It's not about the technology, about people. To do the important stuff when it matters. 
um, I think I think that's uh, that feels like a worthy goal. So um, I think I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our second speaker and technologist, Vladimir Vontrek, who's flown in from the Czech Republic. Yes. And uh, is a medical physicist with specialist in proton beam radiotherapy. But I'll give you much more information. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me here to talk or say something about proton therapy. It does not work. <laughs> okay. So, a bit of physics. All of you love physics. <laughs> so, this part will be really short. Not longer than 40 minutes. <laughs> and the graphs you can see, we call it a depth dose curve. It describes how the dose from radiation is deposited into the matter. In this case, it's water. And each curve, each color, describes the behavior of different particles. The red one is photons, high-energy photons, which are widely used in linear accelerators that are the most common way of radiation treatment in the world at these times. What you can see that the biggest dose deposition, the highest energy, is deposited at the entrance of the beam. It goes from this side. Just to describe what you can see in yellow, this is the deposition of the dose or energy from proton beam. So if you imagine that this is not a water phantom, this is the equipment we like most because it doesn't move, it's the same all the time and it's quite cheap because it's water, then you can imagine that this is a patient body with tumor located somewhere inside, inside his body. So if you would like to irradiate something which is deep in body, you, have, you can see that the right curve, the photons, deliver much higher dose into the healthy tissues before the, the tumor size or three target volume, and also are delivering some dose, some energy behind the, tumor, uh, behind the tumor position. It is not really the case with protons or heavy charged particles in general. And this is the reason why the idea of using a high energy charged particles came into uh, the cancer treatment world uh, the reason is each energy, uh, the, the photon or proton doesn't recognize if the cell it hits is cancer cell or healthy cell. If you kill healthy cells, you are causing toxicity of the treatment. If you are killing the cancer cells, you are curing the patient. This is basically what we want. So to avoid side effects and has to and to have the best curate, you need to have a good dose distribution inside the patient body. And protons are better in this than photons. So here you can see a picture of our treatment machine, how it is uh, how it is constructed. It's a quite big equipment, it's quite expensive, and this is why also it's not very frequent these days. Uh, as I said, it, uh, the dose distribution which comes from the physics of the particles is causing the minimal damage of healthy tissues around the tumor. It also increases the cure rate, and the treatment itself is very precise. We can we can direct the photon beam with precision which is better than tens of millimeter, which is, which is usually even too much precise. 
the pencil beam scanning technology we are using now, when it is, this is the most modern approach, uh, is using very thin proton beam. Well, it's like this. So something like, no, oh, it's, it's much thinner, it's two millimeters. Uh, and you can direct it by magnetic field directly to the position in patient body you need to, to deposit the energy. So the treatment is very precise. The point is the proton stops directly and delivers the most of its energy and its damaging power directly into the tumor and not harming the healthy tissue which are surrounding the tumors. It was basically displayed on the histology pictures. You have seen there are, there are parts that are tumorous cells, but they are surrounded with healthy tissues. You don't want to kill healthy tissues. So the beam is then directed directly to the place you want to have it, and for sure the treatment is very safe. The previous techniques called scattered beams uh, were using uh, not so fine dose distribution, not fine beam, so also the dose distribution around the target volume was not so, so conformal. Basically there is some technology if you don't like the pictures, I'm very sorry because I'm more in physics than marketing. <laughs> <coughs> so, the biggest marketing achievement was to make those letters yellow <laughs> so you can't see them. But basically this is the technology, this is the heart of the proton center, this is the cyclotron. This is the particle accelerator, which accelerates the protons from basically zero energy to 230 mega electron volts. As I said, you, I expect you are experts in physics, so you know what does it mean. But just, to, just for me to, to remind, it, so the protons are leaving the cyclotron at the speed of two thirds of speed of light. So it's two, hundred thousands kilometers per second. It's quite fast. <laughs> I wish I wish I would be so fast I'm driving to London this <laughs> afternoon so it will be but it allows us to penetrate the tissue up to thirty two centimeters in the body. And as you can direct the beam from any direction there is no place in the body which is deeper than 32 centimeters. So basically, it is, uh, this beam can achieve each part of body, each part of body size, and deliver the dose to the tumor located there. This is basically the gantry. This is the technology. This is the treatment room where patient is laying on this, on this robotic couch. He is very precisely positioned. Uh, those of you who, who underwent the treatment of, of with radiation for cancer, you know it looks nearly the same. I mean the table, not the technology, as the LINAC. But the process is exactly the same. The patient has to have the fixation masks. Uh, the positioning is quite precise. Those tables are fully robotic, so it has six degrees of freedom, so it can really position you very precisely according to the beam. And this is just a short overview for those who are not much familiar with the radiotherapy process. The first step is the imaging. Uh, then you have to select the treatment strategy based on the findings, basically from pathology, basically from imaging equipment you have. For the radiotherapy, we are using not just CT scans, we are using MRIs and PET CT scans. Uh, SPECT are not so often because it doesn't provide you the 3D information, it's just, just 2D, 2D information. Uh, as I said, I put good colors to this. Then uh, you have uh, the radiotherapy planning, which is done by professionals who are looking at the patient, at the, at the 
position of the tumors, position of the critical organs or organs at risk, and we are selecting the correct directions from where to treat to spare the most of the healthy tissues in the region. Then uh, we create the treatment aids. I have seen the pictures of radiotherapy masks, for example. This is the fixation equipment, but you have a specific, the, the masks are specific for each patient, but you have some parts of the fixation equipment which is uh, used for all of the patient, like the boards and so on. Uh, then we have to approve the treatment plan because it's not just done by one person, just to avoid mistakes. With radiotherapy, you have a problem. If you deliver the wrong dose, there is no way how to put it out. It's just delivered. So it, you have to be very sure what, what you are treating, how you are treating, what you are treating. Then we do the patient-related QA, so it is the measurement. Basically, all those steps for the patients are partly behind the scene. You undergo the CT scan. This is something you just simply have. You undergo the creation of fixation masks. But this, all these steps are running in the background. Uh, that's why it sometimes takes some time to create a treatment plan before you really start. You can really start the actual treatment. Then we do the plant simulation. This is another CT scan for patients. This doesn't really make a big difference. You just go to the CT scan, but this is the CT scan that really assures that the treatment plan is the same and is created the same way we wanted to have and that the patient did not change, his anatomy did not change during the time when the plan was, preparing, was, was in preparation. Then there is the actual radiation treatment and follow-up of the treatment results. This is one of the most important parts because it gives you or gives us some feedback of how successful we are, what we did to the patient, how we helped, or sometimes unlikely what are the what are the side effects of the treatment. Here I have a comparison of proton and photon plants. The conventional treatments are now using so-called VMAT technology. This is the the Linux machine, the photon machine, which is just running around the patient and treating from different direction. Just to sum up the dose, do you remember the, the red curve on the first slide? To sum up the dose, the energy in the target area, and somehow blur the high energy around, the, around in healthy tissues. For sure, each dose delivered to wrong place matters. This is, this is the problem. But with photons, you cannot simply achieve such a good dose distribution as with protons. This is just because of physics. This, there are some laws that can be changed, but physics laws are not in this group. Physics is working for millions of years the same way, and probably will work. This way, you just can, can't vote if, if gravity is here, so it's, it's just here. <clears throat> and what you can see is um, the, the colors are representing the dose. So where some color is, some dose delivered is there. If no color, this, uh, the CT scan is, you know, is, is just in gray scale. So here, for example, with proton plan, we don't deliver any dose. This is the part of the body that is not affected by tumor. It is not necessary to treat it with ionization radiation. But if you would like to treat the, the neck nodes, like in here, with photons, you simply cannot avoid delivering some dose into this area and this area, this area. So this is, but this dose can cause side effects and, co and can cause also the toxicity of the treatment, which is something you don't want to. So and on the left down image, you can see the differences in between 
those two types of radiation. Where there is no color, there is no change in dose. So we can say that we can deliver the same doses for photons to the tumor, but we are at the same time delivering much higher dose to healthy tissues around it. There is an, <laughs> it, it is the best picture in my, skip it nearly. It is, it is again uh, a treatment which is localized just to the left side of the body. I, I, I know which hand is one, which, but this is really left side because the CT scan is, you are looking to the patient from the, from the feet, so this is, this is the left side, so you can see the tumor is located here. If you treat with, with photons, the high dose region is nearly the same as with protons, but the low dose region with protons is not going to brain anywhere. And any dose to brain for sure may cause some drawbacks. And this is another case of uh, treating the the lower neck nodes, which is also very illustrative, I must say. I, I think you understand all the pictures. Now you can do my job because I'm responsible for checking those plans and creating them. So now you can simply say this one is good, this one is not. <laughs> but I'm too young for retirement, so <clears throat> you have to wait a while. And this is another comparison just to, just to show the, the advantage of finite range of protons in patient body. So in this case, you can see you can deliver the dose to the tumor which is treating, which probably will kill all the cells or nearly all the cells in the tumor. But in, with, with protons, you, can't, you don't deliver any dose to brain. Those is called color wash, so the maximum dose is 60 grays. And you can see that 60 grays you want in the tumor, you have it. But there in the brain, down in photon plan, you have maybe half of the dose, maybe one third of the dose, which is not necessary to deliver. So this is why do we think that the protons are, well, are really good treatment options for patients with, where you know the organs of risk are close to the tumor, which is head and neck cases, for example, or brain, ca brain tumors. But it works for all the sites. Uh, in Prague, we started the treatment in 2012, and we treated patient number 10,000 this April. So nowadays, it probably will be 11,000. I don't have the precise numbers, but because it changes every day. Uh, and we treat daily up to 130 treatments, so it's, we are quite a busy center. And the result says that this really helps. And this is something I, <laughs> and all of my presentations, if you will go for some other proton presentation, just, uh, just really insist on seeing a break curve, which is the yellow curve at the very beginning. That's why I put it there. I know that usually people don't understand really what, what, what's under this, but if you have a proton le lecture, it must, have, it must have the break curve. Otherwise, you have to display your unsatisfaction. <laughs> Thank you for... Thank you. That was terrific. Thank you. Chris, did you want a couple of questions? Or? Yeah. The only thing I say is that when I was at school, I wish he was my teacher for physics, because I, I would have seen it all the way through and got, maybe got an O-level. That shows my age. Um, but well done, thank you very much. The funniest one I've seen all day, really good. And it was a serious subject. And yours was incredible, so, and hopefully technology. We've got, I can take one question from the floor each. Or, the guys are here at lunchtime, 
then we can go into lunchtime because we're running about 20 minutes late at the moment. So I've been told I've got to move quick. So, yeah. I just the mic there when Fahida moves the little legs. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? One question. Hi, um, so proton beam therapy. Um, now we know the traditional uh, photon based radiotherapy. Um, the HPV negative cancers are, are less responsive to photon radiation. What are we seeing in terms of results for uh, the, the, pho uh, the photon beam therapy in HPV negative uh, cases? Well, we are treating uh, we are treating something about 200 new patients for head and neck cancer per year. Uh, the distribution in APV, HPV negative and positive is nearly the same, and the outcomes are not so different. But basically, uh, basically we need more time to evaluate evaluate and follow up. This was one of the, you know, the one of the key. It was the last box, but probably one of the most important ones is the follow-up of the patient and see the outcomes. Thank you. So, um, also some good news is Proton UK, obviously, are based out in Prague. I've been one of the lucky ones that have been to Prague and actually seen the setup. It's incredible. Um, but the good news is they're in the UK now, and they should be. Hopefully, I've been told early January onwards opening one of their new sites, which will be incredible because tomorrow's patient might just get access to it. And I'm hoping people like yourself and everything will start looking at Proton. Don't know what your thoughts are on Proton. Um, well, we, we're sending people up to the Christie at the moment with, uh, with, with great results with a torpedo trial. Uh, surely must be a good thing. I'd like to know more about what you do with residual or recurrent disease, if it's good for retreating as well, because it's particularly accurate. Uh, well, yes, we also do focus on re-radiation re as well, or recurrent diseases as well. But, it, you know, we decide on on individual basis. It yeah. it's can't be simply say, yes, everything is fine. I can't just put it in here, just... <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't completely understand, but it would be... It sounds like it would be a, a better treatment or a good treatment for residual disease the right one <laughs> it'll be nice if we can get proton as an acceptable part of the pathway eventually so that it's even if it's just patient's choice mm. and i'm a great believer in patient's choice so it'd be nice to have it and but having another center like yourselves and instead of just the christie's will be is a great opportunity for having more patients go through it hopefully so guys thank you very much Thank you. Um, I'm sorry to rush you, but I am getting it in this ear, and I haven't got an earpiece, but Sharon's out there, but she's shouting at me. <laughs> so um, thank you very much. But you are here for lunch and everything else, so please see them. A big round of applause. <laughs> so, Philip, I'll take Chris if you want. If you want to leave the floor and, and, and do, do whatever you want to do best. You can take your mask if you... No, you don't. Um, so we're going to go straight to one of my all-time best friends since coming on this journey. I met Chris God knows how long ago, um, but he's, he's a very, very good friend of mine, and I think we've got an introduction. Shut up! Shut up! Honestly, absolute rabble, right? Who's next? Our next speaker was once diagnosed with stage 4 mantle cell lymphoma and given six months. For those of you in the know, there isn't a stage 5, so let's hope he makes it to the end of his presentation. <laughs> He's since gone on to become one of the most influential cancer patients in the world, so enjoy him. While you can, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chris Lewis.
Chris, are you online? I'm online. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but thank God we can't see you. We are running. We are running late, Chris. So thanks for your presentation, and we'll see you again soon. We <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to do, Chris, I'm going to let you get straight into your presentation, and then we'll do some questions at the end. So over yeah. to you, Chris. No worries. By the way, I love that proton beam. I really love that proton beam. Thank you. So my first slide uh, is disclosure. So we have uh, no relevant financial relationships between Chris and myself, despite being good friends. So let's move on. I do hope you're enjoying the conference so far. And I'd like to apologize for not being able to be with you all today. After all, who wouldn't want to be in Torbay in November if they could? Unfortunately, my good run of health has finished for a while. Due to the severity of my initial treatment, my hips are now crumbling and I'm currently unable to walk. So I'm now on the list for my first new hip, making life very difficult and frustrating. But like every other obstacle I've faced, I will get over this one too. I'd like to take this opportunity of thanking Chris and his team at The Swallows for inviting me to talk to you today. I've known Chris and Sharon since cancer entered their lives. The first thing that struck me about Chris was his determination to improve things for people affected by head and neck cancer. He reminded me very much of myself. My journey in the support world had already started and Chris was looking for some tips. Well, he certainly took them on board. He's created this incredible charity and now known around the world for his wonderful work in the sector. He has now become my guru. It's always a pleasure to be invited to speak at these conferences as patient led ones are very few and far between and have a completely different feel about them. Chris invited me to choose my subject and I wanted to talk about the discrimination I've encountered since I entered the cancer world in 2007. That issue certainly never came into my mind during my diagnosis. But over the years, it is something that I've encountered much more frequently, particularly as I get older. So to put this into context, I need to take you back to my life BC before cancer. Those of us that have been diagnosed with cancer will know this already. It is something that we live with daily. Never sure if each ache or pain is something more sinister. Is this not enough to endure? It seems that society just wants to make our lives even more complex by its quiet and often unnoticed discriminations. Maybe you haven't even noticed, but taken these things as normal. They aren't. Unfortunately, those of us with longer term health conditions are treated differently, making it much more difficult to reintegrate with society. Of course, this is not me in the picture, but it could be. This is how I was feeling at work, on top of the world and unstoppable. I had everything a man could want, a wonderful wife, two talented sons making their way in life. Business was great and my phone was constantly busy. I really did feel untouchable. I would built from scratch a multi-million pound business and at the age of 51, I was looking forward to a comfortable retirement. Then came a bad few months for my health, ending up with an emergency visit to hospital when I had to have my tonsils removed. A few weeks later, my wife and I were being told that if things didn't go well, I might only make six months. I had been diagnosed with mantle cell lymphoma stage four, incurable. My only chance was aggressive chemotherapy and an unrelated stem cell donor, if one could be found. Look how quickly life can turn from a very happy and successful businessman to a fragile and vulnerable human being. How was I going to provide for my family? 
My wife had just retired and our plans included more global travel. But it seems what man proposes, God disposes. Nothing could change my situation, so I just had to learn how to deal with it. There certainly is no handbook that you can read to prepare for something like this. I'm a man who loves data and statistics. It was obvious that at some stage my chances were slim. But I did ask the doctor doing my transplant what my odds were. He said they hadn't used this treatment frequently, frequently enough in recent years to know. So I really was heading into unknown territory on a wing and a prayer. A minimum of six weeks to spend in an isolation unit. I received 10 days of aggressive chemotherapy to kill off my immune system and then day zero arrived. My life-saving cells had come across London on a bike and I was hooked up to them watching as this little bag of life-saving liquid dripped into my arm. I wasn't worried about the physical issues of treatment but the psychological impact of being on, in my own company for so long. I can't describe how vulnerable I felt, not knowing if I was going to live or die at any stage. Calling the nurses every time I needed showering or to go to the toilet. All my waste was being measured and analysed. What value did I have to anyone now? Who would want me if I finished treatment anyway? My appearance was changing in front of my eyes with steroids. Would I even find myself attractive, let alone what my wife thought? What work could I do if I survived? Certainly not what, not what I was currently doing. I had no qualifications. So having survived each challenging stage, my diagnosis of my di since my diagnosis, it became clear that the things in life I never thought would be problems suddenly were. Altogether, too, it was physically impossible for me to work as I was never well long enough, so I had to decide about my finances. This proved difficult, particularly if you ever mentioned you had cancer, which I learned early on not to. I had now entered a second phase of life where I had to learn to live again. Rather like going back to primary school, but as an adult, as a confident businessman, I was used to destroying all obstacles to my progress. But my newly found disability, uh, sorry, left me to knock on doors like Oliver Twist asking for help. It took me a long time fighting with my mind to accept small wins instead of big ones. Living with cancer, felt like trying to have a life with one arm tied behind my back. Everything was such an effort, with society making it very difficult every step of the way. The biggest challenge that I found was psychological in an area that is very understated with a cancer diagnosis. In many cases, this issue can be much worse than the physical impact. Will I ever feel useful again? I had just become another statistic on the rising list of people with cancer. People started to feel sorry for me and not knowing who I was in my previous world. Just another person in an NHS gown with my backside hanging out. We could be lords, ladies, bin men or scientists. In this environment, we were all the same. There is no finer equaliser than bad health. Money and position make little difference to your outcome, something we forget far too frequently. So my life was now dominated by hospital visits. I had morphed, morphed into a professional patient, spending increasingly greater time in the NHS. I couldn't help but look around at systems and talk to other patients. I found very little practical support Nothing about work, finances or relationships. All the things you really need help for. All 
charities were offering was booklets and a cup of tea. It seemed that once you were diagnosed with cancer, society had no further use for you, unless you were raising funds, of course. This felt crazy from two perspectives, the social and financial aspect of the country's economy. Sure, many would require complex treatment and may not be able to go back to their previous roles, but were not totally useless. I expected an arm round my shoulder when I left hospital, but all I found was unmentioned discrimination across society. Lenders wanting their money back as soon as you mention cancer. Employers not interested in you. Insurance companies treating you like a cash cow. Many charities putting you on their database for targeted ads and fundraising asks. Even pointing you towards making free wills for their legacy department. Why do we treat vulnerable people in this way? Unfortunately, it is not only cancer that is like this. I needed to establish, establish if I was the only one experiencing this. So my friends helped me create a website and start on social media, as I really was a tech dinosaur then, still relying on calling people by phone. So my website, Chris's Cancer Community, was created and my internet experience took off. I was getting live feedback from writing and I quickly established that most people felt the way I did. Once I had the evidence, I started speaking out. Now my site is read across the globe by many sectors affected by cancer. I was finally being listened to. Here is some more detail about why cancer was added to the discrimination law. This might be of interest to you guys. This act was made to stop discrimination against disabled people. It aimed to make sure people were not treated differently or less well because they have a disability. In my opinion, this hasn't been a great success and has probably succeeded in having the reverse effect. UK law prohibits cancer discrimination under the Equality Act 2010, but enforcement tends to be complaint driven, putting the burden on patients yet again. This is how I began to feel when I tried to pick up my life after cancer. Almost everything I wanted to do involved telling people about my disease. The biggest issue here being applying for a job. Most of us are valued by what we do for a living and we all want to play our part even after life changing illness. But society just doesn't want to change its ancient ways of employing people. Thus, most people with a long term illness will struggle to get employed. If you are lucky enough to have retained your job through treatment, you may find yourself struggling to work at the intensity you did previously. Many don't give work the priori priority it had before. Why does society continue to discriminate against people with a disability? This is not just in the UK, of course, but globally too. Personally, I thought that when COVID came along and we were forced to change the working routines we had accepted, no matter how unsuitable they were, big change would happen in the long term. Working from home, more flexible hours, four day working week, etc. I saw this as a great platform to accept more people with disability back into the workplace, but that hasn't happened. Since COVID, the world has been turned on its head. I imagined a time afterwards when we would all come together to help push society forward. So it's a good job that I don't read crystal balls for a living. What has happened is that we are more divided now than we have ever been. We have wars in Ukraine and Gaza, cost of living crisis, political and industrial unrest. The consequence of all this combined, meaning we are a lot poorer, both physically and socially. In terms of healthcare and cancer particularly, there is now less money and resource being put into the sector. 
Since the decisions to focus only on COVID for several years, there is now a vast waiting list which is increasing by the month. This has also created a bigger postcode lottery than before. People affected by cancer are some of the most vulnerable in society, struggling to fight for their rights whilst they become sicker on a waiting list. The one thing you don't have whilst you are dealing with cancer is time. One area I've been very disappointed with in the cancer world is the role of Macmillan Cancer Support and Cancer Research. They have both now become giant fundraising machines in an ever increasing market. When we needed them to speak out during COVID, they were silent, focusing on their own self survival. Now back on our TVs, telling us how they are there for us, encouraging us to leave money to them in our will, and now telling us how we are beating cancer. I think I must be living in some form of parallel universe with cancer affecting every family frequently. Their combined income is more than £750 million, million million pounds annually, yet more of us are getting cancer than ever. Inequality is an umbrella term which covers income and wealth, but also race and ethnicity, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, age, location and more. It is measured to show how different people have different life experiences and how problems such as poverty and unemployment link to health problems and reduce, reduce life expectancy. It is tracked to help policymakers find answers to the problem. In a world that talks so much about equality, things have never been more unequal. When we started talking about those issues many years ago, our first concerns were equality for men and women, then by colour or nationality. Many large organisations have whole departments costing millions of pounds now dealing with this issue. Since then, we have such a vast diversity of sexual orientation to put into the equation too. Yet we still have so much discrimination happening. In my work with healthcare organisations over many years, I've witnessed incredible discrimination against people who have long-term issues, namely the NHS and cancer charities. Having donated the last 10 plus years of my life to improving the lives of people affected by cancer, I feel very frustrated now. In the earlier years, I could see some tangible progress, but since at, last, since at least five years ago, I believe that things have gone backwards, accelerated by the lack of action during the COVID days. It seems that healthcare is now such a vast black hole that the politicians have lost interest and NHS England is busy with its own infighting. The waiting lists are getting longer monthly and cancer care becomes more complex to navigate. Incredibly, despite cancer affecting 50% of the population in their lifetime, it appears that the public are more concerned about their fuel bills than the impact of cancer. This of course suits everyone concerned, including pharmacy and government. Personally, I don't believe that making another change to the law will make any difference at all. As a society, we must understand the social and economic issues, issues that living with long-term conditions will create. From a business perspective alone, continuing as we are is totally unsustainable. We simply cannot afford to support the growing list of people and must find a way to encourage those that can to work. Flexible hours, working from home, etc. Importantly, we need to value these people much more than we do and not discriminate against them. All of us want to play our part, but our world makes it very difficult to do so. Why do we continue to look at people with cancer and similar as a burden on society?
Life is now incredibly difficult for people affected by cancer, facing lengthening waiting lists and postcode lottery for treatment. Also, there is now a lot less resources being put into cancer research globally. Having focused on this disease for so long, I'm no longer convinced that we are doing things right. For so many years, we have three main weapons against it. Poison, chemotherapy that is, surgery and radiotherapy. For sure, those things have improved with technology and we have more fancy names for them. But the principle is the same and still the numbers affected increase. Is it time to change the way we deal with cancer? Can we really say our previous efforts have been a success? There are now many people looking at such kind of ways of treating their body, but for most of us, we will still be offered the standard treatments, which in many cases do more harm than good in the long term. The most useful thing that I've learned in all this time of treatment is to strongly advocate for myself ask questions and do my research. Finally, ensure you chase, as the system loves quiet patients. Everyone knows me in my own hospital. Thank you so much. As always, these are my own personal opinions based on experiences. I hope I've made you think and I believe we have a bit of time for some questions, but probably less than it was, Chris. <laughs> Chris, um, always very open, always very honest. I think he deserves a round of applause. Um, <clears throat> Hi, Chris. We can, Hi, Chris. we can now all see you. Um, I'm glad okay. you've shaved today, both the chin and the top of the head. Looks very oh, I've well. I've shaved everywhere, Chris. I've I know. Shaved well, everywhere. well done. Um, you're always <laughs> outspoken. Um, you never hold back, which is fantastic. And I remember that day in the pub in the hotel where we had that pint of lager and I just wanted to know how the hell to do this thing. And you've always been there and whenever I've got a question, you're always there. So from me, from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much and thanks for joining us today. It's been great. I think uh, there will that's be... That's mutual, Chris, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I know. We're great friends now. And I think this journey takes us on this road and we meet some great people that we'd never, ever expect to meet and we become great friends. And again, I think that's the positive side out of cancer. So, um, well done. So, is there any questions? I'm going to take two questions for Chris, and then we'll hopefully get you to lunch. So, anyone got a question for Chris? Do you know what? You've stunned them, Chris. Yeah, they're always Oh, there happens. you go. Hey, listen, you've got one. So, you must have smiled, Chris. They're not so scared of you now. <laughs> Once and they just, get going, they won't stop. Yeah, we're just getting a mic. So just say your name, and then obviously... Hi, Hilary, I'm a pa from a patient cancer support group, head and neck cancer support group. Um, just interested in your comments about the, um, the big cancer charities, and I wonder if there was one thing you would like the big cancer charities to be doing which they're not doing. Oh, God, I uh -huh. wanted to finish it early. Just, I, Jesus. No, no, <laughs> Listen to cancer. Sorry, what was your name? Hilary. Hilary. Hilary, thank you, Hilary. Great question, and I knew, that, I knew that would be picked out from the room that particular point. Um, actually, I, I also run my own charity uh, as well, and I give free phones, as Chris well knows, to people affected by cancer up and down the country. And quite honestly, I'm, I'm probably one of the best known patients in the country, and I don't do any work with either of them. Uh, none of them want to collaborate. Uh, they want to collaborate when it suits them. They're quite happy to have patients engaged. But when it comes to actually doing something, they're more of a tick box exercise, I'm afraid. That's my personal experience. They do do wonderful work, of course. Um, but I'm afraid I don't, I can't work with them. They're just very, very difficult to work with when you actually want to change anything. They're all right with their own ideas, but uh, that's about as far as it goes, I'm afraid. They take a lot of money. They suck a lot of money out the market. And a lot of people doing the heavy lifting these days are much smaller organisations and smaller charities. And it makes it very difficult for us to fundraise when those big boys are on the telly every day telling you to go and see your solicitor. So, Chris, if you had a magic wand yeah, and you could do one wish for a magic wand and you wanted to change their attitude, what would that one wish be on a positive note? 
You must yeah, have they should be listening there. to patients much better than they do, Chris. They don't yeah. listen to. They only listen when it suits them, and they only take from it what that what they want to take. You ask them anything that they want to change any of their policies, almost impossible to work with them. Yeah, and I say that from experience. Why wouldn't I want to work with those guys? They're the two biggest in the in the country. Yeah, I, and I have to agree with him from the Swallows' point of view. F apart from the local Macmillan teams, which I. I think the local people doing a great job. Me and Chris are going from the head office department. And if you go to head office at Macmillan, A, the chief, ex and you're going to get me on one now, Chris. Me and you getting together talking this is really bad. Um, but you get the chief exec that is on, you know, almost a million pound a year, chauffeur driven car, you know, three different secretaries. You know, that comes from your pounds you donate. Look at the money whenever you're going to donate to the Macmillans of this world. And, you know, as much as we hate them on TV, they do do a good job of raising awareness and, you know, putting that thought in there. But if you look at their accounts, you know, for a pound you donate, 99p is expenses. One penny. Now, the thing is, they get a lot of pennies. So, you know, and it make, makes a lot of money for them. When you look at something like the Swallows or Chris's accounts, you know, you're looking at, almost 2p is expenses and the rest goes to the end user where would you rather spend your pound that's where we hope that things could make. that's where i would hope that change when i try to collaborate with the big two yes we'll collaborate with you chris but you need to change your colors and you need to change <laughs> your attitude and you need to do this and you need to do it on our terms so i chris, went can out I come said, in there somewhere huh? sorry can I come in there just to say? Yeah, because so, otherwise me you, and you would be here all afternoon. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, everyone wants to get to lunch. But my, my charity is the only charity in the world that gives free phones and SIM cards to people in poverty, right? I deal with almost every single Macmillan Centre in this country, right, with their nurses. I deal with the nurses. Their charity does not even retweet one of my bits of work and they're not interested in working with us. Mm. How many people in this country affected by cancer cannot get onto the internet, right? Now, why won't they share? You tell me. Yeah, yeah, and, and you're right, you know, Chris's charity gives free phones, free line to cancer patients. We do what we do, yet Macmillan of this world and the others will not retweet our work, will not then get on LinkedIn with our work. So there's a lot of stuff that obviously me and Chris not bitter about but wish it could be different so I think we'll leave it at that Chris I think we made our point so and like I say you know if you go in that room there you've got a QR code you can donate a pound or two pound and anyway that's another thing um, but also if you've got any mobile phones and you're upgrading rather than get your 30 quid discount put them to one side and either send them to the swallows and we'll send them on to Chris and Chris will recalibrate them all, put new SIMs in and give it to a cancer patient that cannot have a mobile phone. So make sure you do it. So, you know, it's a way of donating that 30 quid that you could have had as a donation. And what's 30 quid? You know, you're going to give a patient that has got no mobile phone, no access to talking to people, another phone so just have a look how many phones must be in your house or in your cupboards or in your drawers you know we're not looking for the top phone are we chris for you you know no not at all as long as it's smart and it's not it's not got its security on it so if it's an apple iphone it's got to have its security you know the code taken off or or any google account taken off once all that's removed we can do the rest or, or any you just factory reset it yeah yeah so well done chris for that listen chris i am going to move on um, yeah, thanks very much, any more everybody. Quest Thank any you. more questions come in, I'll let you know and I'll give some answers throughout the day. Appreciate you joining us, Chris. Um, thanks. Have go a good back, conference, go everyone. Yeah, Thank go you. back Go back to your restaurant and sunbed now and enjoy your pint. See you <laughs> later. Cheers. Bye. Bye. So we are going to go to lunch. And he's an incredible guy, is Chris. I love him to death. Very outspoken, as you can hear. He's not scared to say it as it is. I have one quick announcement before he comes on. And that is, there's a guy sta sat down here, and I have to say it, Steve? Yeah. So Steve, five days ago, seven days ago, Fajita? Talk up. 
Four weeks ago, you got diagnosed. Four weeks ago, you had your operation. So four weeks ago, I had his laryngectomy. And here he is. When did you come out of hospital? Two weeks ago? Yesterday, she's saying. <laughs> out of hospital yesterday and here today. Laryngectomy patient. <laughs> Fantastic. And that's what gives us hope. And I think from a head and neck, I don't care what Sharon, Sharon's giving me real bitter things now. But you know, we all sit here with our issues and our problems with head and neck cancer and all that. I was lucky I didn't lose my voice. I'm in awe of these guys that lose their voice. Because, you know, if they'd have took my voice off me, they might as well kill me. Because I do like to talk, as you obviously realise. But these guys, and I always find that whenever you talk to a head and neck patient or get in a, you'll always find someone that's worse off than you. And you think to yourself, you know, my journey was bad. And then you talk to someone and think, Jesus, it's nowhere near as bad as them. And then that person will talk to somebody else. And they'll think, do you know what? Mine was bad, but actually yours is worse and yours is worse. And, and I think that's the beauty of bringing everyone together. Because we all can help each other. Our carers can help each other. We can help each other. And on that note, off you go to lunch. <laughs>